Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sabrina McCormick. I'm founder of Resilience Entertainment and co-chair of today's meeting. And I'm Anna Guntz. I'm a pediatric intensivist and co-director of the Children's Environmental Health Clinic, Ontario. On behalf of the full planning committee, we welcome you to day two of the third in a four-part series of workshops on communities, climate change, and health equity. The overall goal of the workshop from yesterday and today is to identify key elements of effective and innovative actions to prevent and mitigate inequitable effects and health risks from one of climate change's most pervasive critical aspects, extreme heat. Yesterday, we had a number of speakers, and we also had participants input information as well from breakouts. And there were about five themes that were that came up. One is the need to improve communication about heat and the health implications. That includes involving valuing nature, as well as the community knowledge. Need, the, another is the need to better characterize heat as a risk in terms of the specific definition and how we describe and define it. The need for correct assessments of the affected communities, while at the same time moving towards actions and implementation, which involves also valuing local action, community knowledge, and Indigenous knowledge and other ways of knowing. The potential for using social change approaches for um, actually integrating health within social change um, programs to input effects of community action. And the final theme that we identified was that all interventions need to be addressed locally. And then when we have these local information strategies, how do we scale them so that other people aren't reinventing the wheel? Today's, we're gonna have a number of sessions, but we are gonna move from identifying barriers in order to actually talking about solutions and creative design. So we've created a number of sessions to help facilitate this and your, participation is actually gonna be hugely important to this. So in the first session, we're gonna hear from speakers about cross-sectorial partnerships and co-creation. And in the second session, we have uh, gathered some experts and we're going to I, review the barriers that were identified yesterday and ask them to think of solutions from their experience and their even just their philosophy and, and their purview. And at the same time, we're also gonna invite par audience participation to to write in solutions as well. And in the, third in the third stage, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the most popular solutions that have been identified by the entire group online uh, and in-house and break out into breakout sessions. And then these breakout sessions are actually gonna flush out these solutions in a lot more detail and test them. And then we're gonna kind of come back together and review them at the end. So. It, at the end of this workshop series, we'll produce a report in the format of a proceedings in brief. These and these workshops are going to be designed to be highly interactive and to look at case studies reflecting people's lived experiences. And so we hope that this will help pave the way for a way forward. And so we want to state this because we really want to emphasize how important it is, um, how we value your participation either through the chat, which is open to everyone across the groups, and through the jam boards that we're going to be using um, and the Q&A sessions in Slido. So let's get started. It's my pleasure to introduce the first session's moderator, Daniel Horton. He's one of the committee members, and he is also assistant professor in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Northwestern University. The floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. I'm very happy to begin the transition of our discussion from barriers to solutions. Uh, the goals of this first session of day two are to understand what it takes to collaborate effectively and co-produce solutions that work for all. So that is working across sectors toward a common goal. To better understand these needs and best practices, we're first turning to the narrative format with two stories of success from a couple Midwest-based practitioners. Uh, but first, a bit of logistics. Audience members are invited to submit questions at any time using Slido, uh, where everyone can upvote the questions they most want to hear our speakers answer. We will address as many of these questions as possible during our panel discussion after the two stories. And for our presenters, uh, you'll have 
about eight to 10 minutes maximum for your presentations uh, to allow time for Q&A at the end. And at the two minute mark, uh, we'll send you a warning via chat that your time is coming to an end. Okay, on to the stories. Our first speaker is Dr. Dana Habib. Dr. Habib is an assistant professor in the Department of Informatics at Indiana University. Today, she will share her experience around design, urban planning, public health, local sensing, and local interventions for climate resilience. Dr. Habib, the floor is yours. Thank you so very much. Um, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. Um, today, I'll be talking about one of our programs called Beat the Heat, um, and talk about how we're integrating communities and, and equity into heat response planning. The Beat the Heat program is a two-year program funded by the Indiana um, Office for Community and Rural Affairs, where we're working with two communities in Indiana, Richmond and Clarksville, to help them develop targeted heat response plans for their communities. Climate change is increasing extreme heat events across the globe, and Clarksville and Richmond is no exception. We can see that by the year 2050, Clarksville and Richmond can expect to see a doubling and tripling of extreme heat events in both of their communities. The Be the Heat grant is divided into five different phases. Um, for this story, I'm gonna really talk about phase one and primarily phase two of community needs assessment and the importance for assessing our communities to really understand their vulnerability and how to tailor strategies to these communities. For phase one, I think one of the things that's really unique about the Beat the Heat program is that we hired a full-time heat relief coordinator for both of our communities. And one of the first things that the heat relief coordinators did was to establish the heat relief task force. The task force was representative of cross-section of the communities, had stakeholders from both government sector as well as from communities, and it really provided support and guidance to our heat relief um, coordinators. And so here you can see different members that were in some of the task force. And in phase two, this is where we did our community needs assessment. In our community needs assessment, we primarily looked at community input through focus groups, interviews, and surveys. Um, we also participated in NOAA and CAPA Strategies Heat Watch, Watch Campaign and created um, heat vulnerability indices for both of our communities. For our surveys, we surveyed both of our communities and we really were wanting to understand the community's understanding of um, their awareness of extreme heat risk, um, but also to understand their adaptive capacities. And one of the most important things that we saw from the survey was really that many members and communities were really experiencing barriers to in-home cooling. We saw that one in three people that took the survey experienced barriers to their home cooling systems, and that the two top barriers were cost of bills and cost of repairs. Some of the quotes that we got in these surveys was, um, for example, Heat is something I think about all the time. There are times when me and my daughters will get in the car and go for a ride because it's much cooler in the car and with air conditioning other than it is in our house. Or another individual said, our only source of cooling are fans and we place fans throughout the house, but we're unable to keep them going for too long because it dries our electric bill up and we can barely afford our electric bill as it is. And so when we're really looking at equity and climate change and extreme heat, it's so important to understand who's vulnerable in our communities to extreme heat and who has the ability to adapt the, to these conditions. Um, we also uh, did, um, conducted focus groups with um, different stakeholders. We conducted focus groups with outdoor workers, older adults, parents, youth, and government employees. Um, and some of the main takeaways that we saw from these um, focus groups, as we can imagine from government employees, a really important need for cross-organizational collaboration. For outdoor workers, the, real, the need for flexibility in their work schedules. Um, for youth and high school athletes, we saw that there's limited knowledge about heat-related illness. And so there's a lot of opportunity here for education and awareness here. For older adults, we saw that they had um, difficulties moving around their communities during hot days. And that parents noted that access to drinking water was really critical, but also a resource that was hard to come by for in their communities. Um, we also participated in um, NOAA and CAPA Strategies Heat Watch Heat Mapping Campaign. Um, this is a campaign that's done across the United States. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Um, it's a wonderful community, a wonderful project, but really needed in order to capture hyper-local environmental data, which is needed to really understand a community's um, exposure to extreme heat. And as a great example of a citizen science project, 
So you can see different images from our communities here um, participating in this program where basically NOAA and Capital Strategies sent us sensors that we mounted on our cars, our bikes, um, and with predetermined routes, we biked um, through um, each or drive through each of our communities. Days were um, selected by working with National Weather Service to really pick a day that was ideal for urban heat island conditions. Um, and just to note too, that Clarksville worked with their high school students um, and really integrated them into the process. So it was a great way for um, to increase education and awareness there too. So here's some of our outputs that we received from um, our heat watch campaign where we can see our hyperlocal temperature data and the heat exposures in both of these communities. We use this data to um, create um, story maps um, as well as to use this for education and engagement. Um, we saw community members use these for grants, um, applications, as well as for um, planning and decision support too. We also use this to create our heat vulnerability indices for both of our communities. A heat vulnerability index is where we are able to identify areas that are most vulnerable to heat. And our main indicators are looking at environmental exposures, sensitivities such as age, and adaptive capacity. For our heat vulnerability index, we specifically um, used evening temperatures um, because we see that nighttime temperatures are better predictors of negative health effects um, to extreme heat. Um, and we also created a sensitivity score for our communities by combining um, different social demographic factors, which include age, educational attainment, race, language barrier, poverty, and social isolation. You can see these different factors um, mapped here on the right. We combined all of those into a sensitivity score, and then we overlaid our heat exposure and our sensitivity score and identified the block groups that were ranked the highest in both heat exposure and sensitivity score. And then we ranked them in priority areas from first to third. And so here's an example. This is what our, um, our priority areas look for both of our communities. What was wonderful then to see how the communities use these types of priority areas. We saw that both communities use these to apply for grants for tree plantings and to plant trees in areas of high um, vulnerability um, and high heat exposures um, for the communities. And we also saw that Clarksville, when working with their um, senior citizens, were also decided to really look through bus stop amenities and how they could help with the transportation system. So also looked at areas that were high to heat exposures and how they could really improve their communities in that aspect as well. And so this pretty much wraps up our community needs assessment stage. We developed the different heat management strategy plans and now we're on phase five of the program. Um, in, in phase three, we develop our management heat management strategies as well as our heat ref, um, wave response protocols for both of these communities. These, these uh, management strategies have been passed and approved through both of their city councils too. And then this is just an overview, just to kind of show all the different strategies our communities worked on to look at with regard to their heat re wave response protocols, public outreach strategies, home cooling strategies, as well as climate responsive design strategies. Um, and now we are in the process of wrapping up our continuity plan, and also looking at different methods for in-home cooling. Thank you all so very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Habib. Our next speaker is Rod Mansur, who is currently the Director of Environmental Innovation at the Chicago Department of Public Health. Today, Rod will share a story about his leadership of the Our Roots Chicago Tree Equity Program. Take away, Rod. Thank you, Dan. Um, exciting to see what's been done with the Heat Watch campaign. We're uh, going to be doing that this year, too. Uh, so thanks for sharing that. I'm going to center uh, our initiative, Our Roots Chicago, more around uh, the community today. Um, our Roots Chicago is an initiative to equitably increase Chicago's urban uh, canopy with a $46 million investment over five years. So it's something like 75,000 trees. Um, we offer some solutions to overcome some of the longstanding barriers uh, and unwind the injustices that have led to having these low canopied uh, uh, communities. So just a little data, it's data informed, but that's just a small piece of what we're trying to do. Uh, 
Um, we prioritized communities. We looked at four buckets of social, economic, environmental, and public health data. We brought it together and we were able to see um, where that tree canopy percentage, where the most benefit will be perceived uh, and realized in the communities uh, where we should uh, be planting these trees. But the data was a small part of it. So it's data informed, uh, but community driven. And what I mean by that is, you know, uh, we didn't start out with this many people in that three equity working group uh, back in August of 2021 probably 20 uh, people. And now uh, there's 135 folks from a lot of organizations. And here it's not to impress you with the number of people uh, that are joining our meetings that are part of this, um, but it's more about the concept of this three-legged stool we've coined, where you bring together community, conservation organizations, uh, you know, researchers, and government um, regularly, once a month, Tuesday mornings at 9 a.m., uh, second Tuesdays of <laughs> every month. And we discuss all issues around uh, tree equity, tree maintenance, planting, watering, policies, procedures, ash trees, um, the list goes on and on. And I don't wanna make it sound like we all agree on everything that's being presented, um, but we are aligned on a mission and uh, we are engaging, we are listening and hearing each other and we're learning from each other. And that's one of the key things here that uh, we have uh, some of these community organizations sharing their best practices. Um, so, you know, we've defined tree equity, uh, you know, but I think what's more important is the definition the community has uh, developed. Um, prioritizing historically marginalized, disinvested, and under canopy communities on the south and west side. But when we ask what tree equity means uh, to the individuals uh, as, uh, that are part of this working group, um, you can see here health was the number one answer. Of course, you see justice, heat, community. Um, all these add up into that definition, but we all agreed um, on this health as part of this uh, strategy. So the community led uh, the logo design. They told us they need a website so that they can drive people to uh, the site to answer questions. They wanted tools, they wanted door hangers, and we developed that for them. Uh, they wanted to combat misinformation in the community, uh, some of the myths uh, that center around trees. Uh, uh, and then we launched on uh, Arbor Day of 2022. Um, but how do you convince residents that something like this, where there are no trees in this community in Chicago, is something that can be someday look like this? Um, and the answer is by going to the community, speaking to those that have been working on the ground uh, on this work and uh, uh, walk their neighborhoods and talk to them. They have the solutions, but there's a need of resources. So combined with understanding what the communities need, lean in when needed and lean back when not. Um, and what the city can do. So we launched, launched this tree ambassador program where we trained and paid uh, community organizations to submit tree requests on behalf of residents instead of waiting for someone to request a tree. And we learned what our foresters do in the city and we passed that along uh, to the community. We created tree ambassadors and you can see in Little Village and in North Lawndale, in Pilsen and in Roseland, um, we go out to the communities and train, and uh, they then train, the, they are train the trainers, and they go out into their communities, and hopefully the force multiplier effect of not only educating about the benefits of trees and seeing if a tree does fit within the parkway of the city of the publicly owned area, but 
to uh, engage the residents uh, because 30% of trees are on public property, the rest are on private. So um, this train, the trainer's model was developed so that the number of tree ambassadors can increase in the community and they can help shape, this is important, shape the character of their own neighborhoods. Um, we planted the 18,000 trees. There's a picture of uh, some of our officials. And um, uh, this is uh, this year, uh, we're planning to plant 15,000 minimum. And on the right there, you see the Chicago Architectural Center worked with us to have a tree exhibit called Recover. And that's some of the tree working group folks uh, who says that you can't have fun doing this. Um, so uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, there's my contact information and feel free to visit chicago.gov uh, backslash our route. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you much. Scott. Thank you so much, Rod. Uh, we have plenty of time for Q&A, so if you have questions, please put them in the Slido. Uh, I'll start out with a question for you, Rod. Um, so I, I think it's rather interesting that in Chicago, the tree, the tree planting program is run out of the health department. And so I'm, I'm curious, how does that work? And um, how do you mesh with the other agencies that might care about trees in the city? Um I wouldn't say lead, co-lead is probably, but yeah, it did originate out of public health. Uh, public health does not plant or maintain any trees in the city of Chicago. We don't have foresters. Um, but I think bringing in that expertise of uh, community um, engagement, community collaboration, uh, and the public health data, bring it to the silo departments. Uh, the folks that plant trees are parks, uh, streets and Sanitation, Department of Transportation. The landscape ordinance is run under the Department of Planning and Development. And then we have a Chief Sustainability Officer. And you can see how that can be spread across different departments. So we thought, how can we create an umbrella? And the Tree Equity Working Group was part of that solution where every month, it's not just community organizations and conservation organizations and researchers that are meeting at this uh, working group, it is government representatives regularly, all the time from all the departments and agencies. And uh, we come together and it's an opportunity for community to address the uh, tree equity um, in one meeting, in one sitting, not emailing or calling different people trying to find an answer. We work on that together. And I think uh, public health, um, uh, convene this and leads it. And I think that's important, especially when you see the definition of tree equity, where all the members thought health could be at the center of this work. Thank you. Thank you. My next question is for uh, uh, Dr. Habib. Uh, I know that uh, you indicated that some of the data that you acquired uh, during the NOAA campaign is, is part of what underlies uh, your, your heat vulnerability indices. I'm curious about your perspective on the value of uh, local generation of data or co-generation of data and knowledge to building community trust and having the community adapt uh, the, the uh, policy suggestions that you're making. Yeah, I think that's a wonderful question and so important to be able to engage the community, both in giving them a voice and power and also building that trust with them. Um, so one thing that I thought that was really wonderful that came from Richmond was that not only did we create our HVIs, um, our heat vulnerability index and our priority areas in order to really target policies, but we use that approach to really be able to educate the communities and have the communities um, around um, the, there are different vulnerabilities to heat, but also to um, create volunteers um, with the communities around tree planting. And so Richmond had specifically created tree tenders, which have never had a volunteer for tree planting before. And so tree tenders specifically came about from this grant and another where training was done for tree planting, but also the focus on really 
prioritizing that planting in, in the most heat vulnerable areas. Um, so I think bridging those two um, together was really great to see both the data coming in, but then also the community organization that happened as well. Um, the other thing that was really important with building trust with the community is getting access to our most vulnerable community members. And this is something that's really difficult and we saw was difficult in both of our communities. And so really being able to, you know, work with stakeholders who have already built that trust and be able to power them and give them the resources in order to work with these communities. Um, so a lot of our housing insecure um, residents in our communities both of our heat relief coordinators really worked with stakeholders that they identified that had already built those trust and then developed things such as cool kits distributions too by figuring out things that they would need. And so um, coming together by creating these cool kits and then working with different community members to distribute to distribute those. Um, so that was another great example of seeing both, you know, the data coming in, but also seeing the um, that engagement with the communities and the important stakeholders there. So uh, both of you have, have touched on uh, building green canopies or tree planting, and we had a lot of discussion yesterday, and and it's come up again uh, in the Slido chat. Uh, so here's a question for both of you. Um, one ongoing concern I hear from communities is the fear of green gentrification. And I'm curious uh, for both of your perspectives on, on ways to prevent this practice. That's a great question. This came up early on, um, first posed by researchers who kind of, you know, uh, came up and thought that that was a risk. And it was immediately addressed by community members. Um, those have the that have been working on the ground in trying to increase the tree canopies in their community. And um, I'm gonna quote her, Anna Maria from North Lawndale, um, who stopped and said, um, it's not gentrification when the community is running it. And so uh, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't have said it any better. Um, uh, the idea of having community members go door to door, engaging with residents, surveying uh, the parkway where trees can go is at the essence of what we're trying to do. Having the community shape the character of their neighborhood, not the city, uh, not only decided by the city or by others. So it is a true you know, community uh, driven uh, uh, initiative. And just to kind of add on to that, I think the important thing to note here is that housing stability is so important when we look at the adaptive capacity of communities with climate change. And this is something that plagues our communities across the country is that ability for housing um, stability. And so I think this is a larger issue of really what's driving instability. We don't want to keep our communities from having healthy environments because that might raise property value, but instead these more core issues need to be addressed of really, you know, tackling housing and stability because we can't talk about, you know, really having adaptive capacity and building resilience if our communities don't have that stability in housing. Um, both of you spoke uh, quite a bit about engaging with the community and you're you're coming from one from government and one from academia and and certainly there's challenges with working um with community organizations and vice versa and and so i'm curious about the development of these relationship with with community organizations from a government perspective but also from an academic perspective um what are some barriers that you ran into and what are some ways that you got beyond that and then how long did this take to develop? I know that relationships can take a long time to build. And so uh, what are your perspectives on this? Hard to put a number on the time frame. Um, some are easier, some are harder. I think the thing that should be emphasized is get out of the office and meet with the community um, and understand um, what they what what they're going through and what their uh, what their needs are. Um, I did say in my um, presentation to lean in and lean back when not needed. 
Um, and that's important. Um, I, I think sometimes we want to do onto or do for instead of doing with. And so uh, that, you know, can, that can create a lot of problems um, because it's not coming from community. Um, having conversations and being honest, there's always this uh, toe the government line, I think sometimes where um, we're very careful about what we say, but I, I think that if you just let down the guard and understand that a lot of uh, the distrust and um, sometimes the advocacy and push is not directed personally at like myself. Uh, it is an opening and an avenue to talk about uh, issues that they've been aggravated by um, to put, uh, you know, uh, not only aggravated, but also affected by um, uh, the way the bureaucracy is set up where they don't have a voice. And so uh, listening is a key part of this and don't worry about defending past whatever. Um, we're here to change that. And uh, I think going out there and talking and listening and being a part of it, when they invite you over, um, you can't say you're busy. Um, when they have their community meetings that they want you to join at 7 p.m. on a Tuesday, you join, <laughs> you know, it's uh, it, it is a rough schedule sometimes being there Saturday and Sunday um, and having uh, them having your telephone number. Um, but that's, I think, a part of that overall building trust. So we all know where we're coming from and it can be lead to real genuine relationship. I think the, um, the time aspect I can't be underestimated. It takes so much time to build that trust and those connections. Um, and it's one of those things that um, that can't just happen at the beginning of a project. And so understanding who has built those already, those establishments, those trust, those those connections um, and and whether you're doing that that work or you're giving the resources to the people that already have that connection too. Um, I think it's always this like tension between realizing that a lot of communities are all are always are often overstrained too. And so that fine line between engagement but not putting burden on the community. And so meeting them at their needs and kind of as what was mentioned too, you know, going to them for for meetings and really understanding that time cost too in engagement and that, that importance to it. I really love the idea of our task force and really bringing in community members into this. And so when making these types of policies or plans or even trying to understand assessments, that I've really felt like both of the community's task force were so important um, for our heat relief coordinators to understand who were the important people to go to and talk to that had the connections to be able to reach the most vulnerable communities in need. Um, and so I think bringing, making sure you're bringing people to the table to give them um, the, the voice and to have, you know, um, power over how decisions are made or maybe how policies are directed um, to was really helpful um, in the overarching plan for, for Beat the Heat. All right, I have a, a couple of nitty gritty questions for each of you um, from the Slido. Uh, the first is for Dr. Habib. Uh, was the heat vulnerability index used for the mapping in Indiana different from the social vulnerability index? So the question is asking, was the heat vulnerability index different than the social vulnerability index? Yeah, I believe we're looking for a little bit of clarification on the distinction between the two. So what we did was we created a social vulnerability we indicator. And then what we, for our heat vulnerability index, what we did was that was our index, but then we overlay social vulnerability and heat exposure. We didn't combine those into the exposure. One thing that we did, one thing that was really great about our program and is still great is that there was a ton of education that went into our program with both of our communities. We had many webinars on looking at extreme heat and engagement with communities, how to do focus groups, what's important for asset mapping, looking at extreme heat and extreme heat thresholds. So there was so much education that went in through this um, phase and the very, especially the very beginning of the program, um, which I find to be very valuable. Um, 
But then we also went and we talked about our heat vulnerability index to understand that indices can be misleading. And so it's important to understand which, which characteristics you want to take, uh, strategize for and to prioritize. And so that's when we had all of our maps separate and said, if you want to focus specifically on um, elders that, in, that live in isolation, then these are the block groups for that. And you can target policy specifically for that. But if you want to look at all the different types of, um, of um, and all the different demographic characteristics together, then we have an indicator for that. If you just want to look at heat exposure, you can look at that separately. If you want to combine the two, th these are our priority areas. And so we really walked through that entire process, talking about the pros and cons of this um, and really understanding, you know, also the limitations that we have with a lot of our demographics and census data being at such low spatial resolution and the power that we have from working with Kappa and NOAA getting that really high resolution heat exposure data too. Great, and uh, one last question for you, Rod, uh, on the governance structure of the Our Roots Tree Equity Program, um, how does that work? Um, I lead the tree equity working group meetings. Um, I collect agenda items. Uh, we have the chief sustainability who, uh, officer who drives um, across all the departments uh, and strategizes with them individually. We we don't have it as formal as you think it would be um, because it coalesces easily. Um, if public health brings in the community part and the foresters bring in their know-how and uh, the chief sustainability can oversee all that, that's basically that loose kind of internal piece. Now, uh, the working group members though, and empowering them, uh, there's a lot of conservation organizations that are integral to making this work. Um, Open Lands, the Chicago Region Trees Initiative at Morton Arboretum, uh, the, the uh, Trust for Public Land, they're already in working with community members, but uh, we figured out how to uh, leverage some of their existing work. And uh, without them, there's just government people meeting about trees. So uh, that piece is more important, I think, than us. If we bring the money um, and they bring the engagement uh, and it comes together, um, you know, we, we don't micromanage how a lot of that happens. Um, so uh, they've done a great job uh, uh, reaching out to community and we don't want to interrupt that. Uh, like I said, you know, they'll come to us and say, uh, this is what we need. It, as minimal as a community organization that says, can you uh, create 200 flyers for us? I mean, um, it's very uh, laid back and it's worked. Although others have tried to formalize it more and structure it more, I feel like we might lose that ability to pivot and be more dynamic and address problems that come up. Like we're at a severe drought right now in Chicago. Um, and uh, do we wait for change of command? Do we go through outside departments that will now be uh, given uh, the uh, power, I guess, to overshadow a lot of what we do? So I think this shared power is the best way to go. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you both for sharing some of your perspectives and your successes. But more importantly, thank you for the work that you've been doing in your communities. Um, we're going to transition now to uh, session number two, which is moderated by my fellow committee member, Cecilia Sorenson, who is the director of the Global Con Consortium on Climate and Health Education and associate professor of emergency medicine and environmental health sciences, all at Columbia University. Thank you so much, Daniel. And in this session, we're gonna to continue to build on solutions. This session is entitled Interactive Cross-Sectoral and Transdisciplinary Solution Building Panel Discussions. So let's get started. The goal of this session is to explore an integrated multi-sectoral approach 
um, with the hope of arriving at a set of effective, innovative actions for, for addressing some of the identified problems and challenges related to extreme heat that were brought to the forefront from day one. So for this, I will facilitate a collaborative discussion with panelists from different sectors and ask you as the audience to also propose solutions, actors, and actions. So to accomplish this, this session is gonna be divided into three parts. The first part is where the panelists will each provide a two minute opening uh, remarks uh, given their names, their positions, and actions they are taking at their levels towards solving specific heat issues. Then our facilitators from yesterday's four different breakout rooms will briefly present a summary of barriers or challenges to the panel, and our panel will have 10 to 15 minutes to debate and explore innovative, integrated solutions that align with the needs of all sectors represented. In parallel, we invite you, the audience, to submit your ideas for solutions um, during this time as uh, our facilitators are presenting the challenges and barriers that were identified and all of this will uh, will be uh, woven into our meeting summary report. So with that, um, I would like to welcome our esteemed panel. If we can bring them onto the screen. Our first panelist is Hunter Jones, who is representing a federal government perspective. Hunter, uh, your two minutes is starting now. Thank you very much and uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm uh, with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and um, representing the National Integrated Heat Health Information System, NIHIS, uh, which uh, we launched in, in 2015. It was actually jointly launched by NOAA and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. But at this point, we have a ton of agencies that are a part of our group. Um, I, I wouldn't want to start listing them because it would take a while. Uh, but if you go to heat.gov, you can see all the agencies we work with. Um, and you know, the, the idea behind launching NIHIS was really to provide a coordinated federal response to extreme heat. Um, and so we were responding to a number of issues that we saw uh, and that have been discussed already in, in this wonderful session, so or in this wonderful uh, workshop. Uh, the impacts are often invisible and, and delayed and hard to quantify of heat. And so we've been trying to, to change that. Um, heat governance has been a challenge at all levels, including the federal level, and so that's one reason why we wanted to bring all these agencies together, together to work on heat. Um, we also identified the issue of heat affecting uh, marginalized groups differently and having um, greater impacts, and so we wanted to start to uh, illuminate that more and help communities um, take on heat. And then uh, also we wanted to really focus on the timescale issues with respect to heat. So heat is something that you can respond to in the moment, but it's also something you can plan for and, and prepare for uh, and be resilient to. So we really wanted to kind of think on all these different timescales about how we would help uh, people manage heat. Um, so I'm really looking forward to uh, this discussion with the other panelists. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Hunter. I know you'll have a lot to add to this. And next, I'll turn it over to Vivek Shandas. Okay, um, it's great. Following Hunter. Uh, hi, everyone. Vivek Shandis. Um, uh, he, him, his. Um, I introduced myself and some of the projects yesterday. And well, just uh, quickly note is just um, several tensions that exist in this field right now and ways uh, like this forum to be able to directly um, confront and explore what those tensions might look like. A few of those tensions include um, what we were just hearing about. Uh, from Raed is the idea of formal versus informal approaches. That's something that comes up over and over in the work that I'm doing. Um, another is uh, related is the relationship between lived experience of heat um, and the tension of technical expertise brought into that um, understanding. Um, another one is uh, letting perfect be enemy of the good. And that is something I continuously see a lot of preventable uh, deaths that uh, could occur as a trying to get this exact perfect. Um, and, and a fourth one of five that I'll just mention here is the idea of um, kind of characterizing risks uh, first and then leading to actions, as I was mentioning in yesterday's uh, session. And finally, um, this idea of slow and planned response versus uh, the fast and responsive approach. And that gets to Hunter's point about timeliness. And these are things that I'm consistently seeing uh, play out, and there may be several others that I could point to as we as we explore the conversation a bit more. But things that we're doing to try to get at these tensions is trying to ex understand exposure pathways. What are the what are the means by which people are getting 
uh, direct exposure to heat. We we don't arguably have a, a, a evidence and um, data on that. We also don't have a lot of evidence on evaluating effectiveness of particular interventions. We, this is a long game and we really are throwing lots at this right now and we really need to get into that zone of evaluating. So I'll stop there for now and look forward to the conversation with others. Thank you so much, Vivek. You're coming in and out just a little bit. So if there's anything you can do on your end to adjust your connection, um, that would be great. Our third panelist is Jessica, uh, who is representing an industry perspective. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jessica Tradinic. I know that last name is challenging to pronounce. Um, so as you say, I do bring the industry perspective. I also, um, I am an occupational health and safety professional by background. So I bring that perspective also. Um, and of course, also, finally, the perspective of a concerned member of the public. Um, and I'm interested in this conversation for many reasons. First, the space between occupational and home or private exposures um, is narrowing in, in this day and age. Um, what is a worker? What is a member of the public? Workers are increasingly um, driven by the gig economy, seasonal workers, um, things like that. So these populations are not disparate from each other. And of course, as we've discussed, the exposures to heat via personal life and also via workplace life interact with each other. And both exposure sources are important to consider. And I think this workshop has done a really good job of that so far. Um, I'm particularly interested in the workplace conversation because as we've talked about today and yesterday, workers have historically often not been considered at risk populations, but of course we understand today that they are particularly at risk because they cannot avoid their exposures by reducing physical exertion or staying indoors in cool places often. And so workers need um, particularly proactive interventions. Um, and finally, my interest in the conversation is driven by my experience in occupational health. Um, so while it's true that heat risk can be difficult to predict and difficult to characterize, we do have roadmaps available to us to help us do this, both for occupational uh, uh, exposures and also for um, home life or personal life exposures. So there are three examples that I um, have of how we can pull occupational health practices into this. I know I don't have a lot of time, but very briefly, in occupational hygiene, we aim always to anticipate first, recognize um, characterize and control risks. And as others have said, I think that's the approach we need to take to the challenge of extreme heat. Um, we have also a, a very proven practice of um, creating similar exposure groups. I haven't heard this concept mentioned specifically in that in that term, but that's the practice of creating subpopulations of individuals whose risk can reasonably expect it to be the same. And then you design controls and protections for those groups, and that's a way to impact, um, to amplify the impact of actions taken. And then finally, the hierarchy of controls. So in situations where we get to that place where we need to control a risk, um, we need to make sure to follow the hierarchy of controls in order to prioritize the actions that we identify that we should take and also to inform decision making about which actions to take. And there are plenty of examples about how we should prioritize first the elimination of the hazard and then controlling the hazard through engineering controls all the way down to possible personal, individual, protective uh, solutions. And we can, I'm sure, during this session, explore that in greater detail. I'm happy to be here. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Jessica. And uh, over to uh, Dr. Rupa Basu, who is representing a state government perspective. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Rupa Basu. Thank you, uh, Cecilia, for that introduction. Um, I'm currently at the Air and Climate Epidemiology section at one of the California EPA's offices with the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment. And um, I'd like to kind of come from a, I'm an epidemiologist by training. I started this work really half my life ago, <laughs> 25 years ago. And I, um, at that time, we were really basing our work on case reports following heat waves. So we have come a long way. We've developed epidemiologic methods. We've looked at mortality, um, identified high-risk populations, um, also considered morbidity outcomes. And I think at this point, um, I agree with the other panelists, we're, Something that's been repeated over and over again um, from this morning and also yesterday is that we are at this point now where we have done this work um, and we need to move forward with interventions, um, really thinking about high risk populations and communities, um, getting community workers 
involved. It's kind of like we now have this big picture. We know what's going on. Um, we need to kind of hone in on and use the knowledge that we've created so far over the past 20, 30 years um, to develop interventions. I think we all agree that it's not going to be the same interventions for every community. So we have to really try to think about what will work in each um, location. And it has to be very um, specific to that location based on vulnerable populations, um, high-risk uh, groups, but also what is feasible. Um, a lot of times we hear about cooling centers as an intervention. In some places that works great, um, movie theaters, for example, shopping malls, um, senior centers, and other places people lack the transportation to even get to these cooling centers or may not even think about going there. So we really have to think about this in terms of each community. Um, and of course, we can develop plans um, that we can, uh, as a state government employee, uh, think about working with local health departments. Um, but I think we have to take it a step further and again, um, include community members to think about um, what will work. And um, this, I wanna say again and again, a lot of the heat related mortality, morbidity um, is preventable. So we can get there. Thank you so much, Dr. Basu. And I'll turn it over next to uh, Nikki Cooley, who is representing an indigenous perspective. Over to you, Nikki. Yeah, um, my name is Nikki Cooley. I'm from the Diné Nation, uh, more commonly known as the Navajo people. I live here in Arizona, Flagstaff, Arizona, the rightful homelands of the Navajo Hopi, Wallapai, Havasupai, and many other Pai tribes. I am the co-director of the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals. We're based at Northern Arizona University, and I also co-manage the Tribes and Climate Change Program. We work with tribes across the country on climate adaptation and mitigation um, via workshops. Um, we have introductory and advanced courses, webinars. We offer technical assistance to assist tribes in addressing climate impacts. And one of the things that we are largely focusing on is the inclusion, the ever, um, the always uh, mentioning of traditional knowledges, indigenous knowledges. So the Biden-Harris administration submitted um, federal guidelines for decision-making processes using indigenous knowledges. And that is a huge uh, victory for us because in our work, we stress the use of indigenous knowledges, even in every sector. And right now we're talking about the impacts of heat on indigenous peoples. And we are trying to have the federal government, uh, even at the regional, local, community level, governance level, to consider indigenous ways of knowing, because these types of knowledges have been knowingly and intentionally excluded from every conversation because we feel that there are indigenous ways of doing like traditional um, uh, structures that can help with cooling of you know communities that are facing high heat um, such as we are facing here in Arizona so that is one of the things uh, that we are working with tribes on. And I'll talk a little bit more um, about what I do. So, and I just wanna mention to everyone here, I don't speak for any specific tribe, um, even though I'm from the Diné tribe. Um, we work with tribes and some of the information that um, I will be sharing, um, I have been given permission, but I don't speak for all indigenous people. So I'll pass it back over to you, Cecilia. Thank you so much, Nikki. And now I'll turn it over to Jane Gilbert, who is representing a local government perspective. Great, thank you, Cecilia. And thank you, National Academies. This has been great to hear everybody's comments and discussion. Um, yes, Jane Gilbert, Chief Heat Officer in Miami-Dade County. I was appointed two years ago by our mayor to address the increasing uh, risks, health and economic risks associated with extreme heat in our region. And um, it's great to hear everyone talk about involving community cross-sectoral solutions because the way 
I was charged to address this issue was exactly that, was to, one, we did hire some researchers to do a heat vulnerability assessment and excess heat study to really understand the conditions at which people were most at risk and the areas, geographies, and demographics of people that were most at risk in our particular region. But we also engaged through our place-based foundation across Miami-Dade County has 34 municipalities within it. We have our state health department, our National Weather Service, our community-based organizations, our university partners, all of which were involved uh, in our climate and heat health task force. And we did a community-wide call for people with lived experience from low-income communities and provided them a stipend to participate as an official task force member. We then did a series of public workshops where we had our community partners, our municipalities, et cetera, do a big outreach to make sure we got as many voices in the room as possible to address the different issues related to extreme heat. So our heat action plan, which was released last year, is a collective action strategy. It's not a county-owned strategy. It is actually under our Resilient 305 rubric we have, or framework, we have uh, uh, other entities, the National Weather Service or community-based organizations or our school district leading on different actions within that strategy. It's under three main goals. And we talk about short, medium, long-term solutions. It's got all of those engaged on it. We're, we're moving forward on all of them now, but some of them will take longer for fruition. So our first one is about informing. We've got to keep it super brief uh, just for the introduction. So uh, sure. we'll get to a lot of this later. Yeah, thanks. So it's three main goals, inform, prepare, and protect people, cool our homes and emergency facilities, and then cooling our neighborhoods. And I can get into more detail. Thank you so much. And over to Gary Harris, who is representing a nonprofit perspective. Thanks. Like, thanks so much, uh, Gary Harris. I'm managing director for the Center for Sustainable Communities. We're about making communities greener, cleaner, healthier, safer, and more climate resilient. And we do that through an equity and environmental justice lens. And, and our approach to this, uh, to to, uh, to to the effects of heat is is in an umbrella program called building a weather ready nation for all, and this is, this really came out of a snowstorm event that, that happened in Atlanta a long time ago and such. And since then, we, we built a number of programs uh, to handle handle se se severe weather, uh, 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 which includes heat and tornadoes and hurricanes, et cetera, et cetera. We, and, and we and we do this by capacity building in, in communities. We do, we do this by meaningful community engagement by exchanging te technical knowledge, by actually developing uh, com 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 computer-based technology, by education, uh, through environmental justice, et cetera, et cetera. A example, we, we work with Raytheon to, to, to produce an animated uh, series of, uh, of, of, of severe weather interactive tools that, that will guide the communities through uh, uh, heat-related heat uh, measures. Next, we, we work with uh, uh, the, the state of South, South Carolina in developing their EJ Strong program, uh, which looks at risk and, and hazards and, and capacities and vulnerabilities of a particular community as it relates to heat and, and, and other vulnerabilities and such, and, and from there, driving out action plans. From there, you know, we we, we focus on communities where we want to, we want to empower them. And, and, and in 2017, we won... Uh, for FEMA's award for, for, for community engagement or our rally for resilience. And that's where we, we're getting everybody together in the community, along with experts and specialists to exchange, to have dialogue, dialogue and such, and talk about heat and other severe, severe weather related matters in a fun interactive session. Next, uh, we, we're working with the NWCP, we went with their climate and, and, and energy justice program. And there we, we, we developed guidelines for, for, for community engagement and projects and programs that may cause heat island effects, et cetera, et cetera. And lastly, you know, we, we work with something called uh, the, the Building EJ tool or the Building Environmental Justice tool, where we work with AutoCase and a number of developers and planners and such to, 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 to develop a tool that would ask the question, if we build this, how will it affect the community, including the, the heat island effect? So a number of things we're doing under building a weather-ready nation for all. 
Thank you so much, Gary. And as I think we all can see, we have an incredible range of expertise on this panel. We also have this incredible audience, everyone here. Um, so thank you all so much. So for the next phase, we are going to have each of our facilitators from day one give a two minute summary of some of the main challenges and barriers that were identified. And we're going to put these problems in front of this panel and let your incredible expertise come to bear on them. We hope this will be really exciting and engaging. Um, I wanna sort of just caution everybody to limit your remarks to 30 seconds to one minute so that we can be sure to uh, represent as many perspectives as possible. So for those of you in the audience, there will be a link put in the chat where you can join a Slido and we invite you to propose solutions as we go through the different challenges that will be presented. And um, now we will turn to our first um, set of challenges. And um, Carlos, you represent the Natural and Built Environment Breakout Group. And what were your major takeaways from the discussion yesterday? I, I do represent them. And so for those of you who are in the group yesterday that was led by Mikhail Chester, um, don't be thrown off. Um, uh, we uh, Mikhail is not able to join us today, so I will be pinch hitting. Is that the right sports analogies, pinch hitting? I'll be substituting for him today. So just as a reminder, natural and built environment included a range of blue, green, and gray infrastructure and facilities like cooling sensors, et cetera. So I'm going to quickly go through three themes. Um, obviously, there, were, there was a lot of conversation. We invite you all to go back to the gem board to see some of those. But the three, categorizing some of these in three themes, I'll describe the themes and pose it as a question for you designated panelists to respond to. Um, the first is a challenge with the most diffused current intervention and that for heated, heat emergencies in the natural built environment, and that would be cooling sensors. Um, there's a lot of discussion about restrictions, um, including um, federal restrictions, uh, particularly like in FEMA around cooling centers and what the alternatives to cooling centers could be, such as resilient subs, et cetera. So that's number one. So who, I'm gonna ask all the designated panelists, who are the agents that are controlling these? What is their jurisdictional authorities, their constitutional authorities, and how those could be altered into feasible solutions for dealing with cooling centers as the first intervention. The second is the challenge with a less diffused intervention. Um, and that would be, and I'm going to be lumping greening, green space, and land use change um, overall. And so that's a barrier that there was a range of barriers to local land use changes and greening. Um, some of the ones that were mentioned were municipal planning, zoning. Um, uh, Dr. Chester himself mentioned his own homeowners association as being responsible for this. So these agents, the local government versus county, state, federal roles. So particularly those of you that are re representing local government, um, uh, uh, Jane, I'm going to be pulling on you to certainly talk about Miami-Dade with a very forward-thinking mayor, um, but who has very clear constitutional divisions about land use rules. And so I'm happy to hear your comments on that. Third uh, challenge is with the less diffused, inter um, excuse me, uh, the, the challenge that we have least um, with the least understood phenomenon, and that is a lack of knowledge around indoor um, uh, heat and temperature quality. This came up repeatedly yesterday because the, the overemphasis on outdoor heat exposures, um, but certainly in ex existing residential commercial uh, properties, so many of the heat deaths and heat um, health hazards that we see are indoors. So thinking a little bit more about who are the responsible parties here, how could city governments, landlords, those who control um, indoor um, air qualities, not just for new. So I'm cautioning the group not to focus on solutions like building codes, which are helpful, but looking at existing properties and how um, one can provide solutions for that um, uh, built environment set would be helpful. And those are the three. So I'm gonna pass it to the designated panelist who I believe is gonna, we're gonna start with Jane. Yeah, let's start with Jane. All right. Go ahead, Jane. Okay, uh, my internet's been a little unstable, so apologies. Just on the first one, thank you, Carlos. Um, the concern I think I actually was in the group and expressed was really evacuation facilities that in the event of a widespread and extended power outage, we don't have 
in several of them, enough backup power to keep them cool. And when we went to try to apply for grants, there was challenges through FEMA to actually provide those kind of that kind of support. So I wanted to be specific on the challenge. I don't have the solution to that one. But what we did do is pivot and try to work and get a BRIC grant for a cooling center slash resilience hub um, that's more a daytime facility. Um, uh, in terms of some of the land use questions that you had, Carlos, I think um, you know what we try to do at the county is through our comprehensive plan, through our land use, is to try to create some that are our ground level that all our municipalities have to live up to, and then if they want to do a stronger code, they can. Um, and so that's what we work towards with our with our landscape and, and street tree master plan um, code in, in terms of that. But we are revisiting that as we speak. We've got a whole urban forestry plan as part of our heat plan. So that's a that's another piece that we're looking at. Thank you so much. And I wonder if Jessica, you have any thoughts on our, uh, our challenge of a lack of knowledge around indoor heat and temperature quality. Uh, it is absolutely a challenge, of course, to characterize the hazards that are present um, in a way that we know that they're going to represent the day-to-day, minute-to-minute realities. Um, I'm not sure, honestly, how extensively sensor technologies, real-time detection capabilities have been explored as a way to sort of um, characterize and zone in real time. It looks like Jane has knowledge on that topic. Yeah. So, I, sorry, but we used uh, university partners to place sensors in homes, and then interview. And then they did through a, you know, they had to sign off on research. I forget what the IRB rules or whatever, but they made sure they could interview them and do extensive interviews so that they could match the temperature humidities with the experience of the people inside. And then with NOAA, actually, um, Hunter was involved with this. We placed sensors outside those homes to understand the correlation between inside and outdoor heat. Mm -hmm. um, it's helping, but I, we still lack data on really understanding where all the people are that are AC insecure and energy burdened in so our county. Let's move towards solutions. I want to push you guys to think about, um, you know, what are the solutions to this? And, and maybe Hunter, you have some thoughts in terms of some of the data you've received and, and how we can improve um, our lack of knowledge. Yeah, uh, so I'm kind of reflecting on some of these, these themes that came out of the, the first group. Um, when it comes to the, you know, making changes in the built environment, one solution that we supported um, that actually is building on a lot of the urban healing mapping campaigns that we worked on throughout the years is uh, with a group at the University of Arizona and Arizona State University that that not only developed an authoritative guide on, on um, how urban planners and design and other professionals can mitigate heat in the built environment, but they also built on a previously developed uh, approach called PERS, the Plan Integration uh, for Resilience Scorecard. And um, they, they extended it to heat. And what it is is essentially a planning tool to look across a number of different um, documents, your, your, um, you know, your resilience plan, your sustainability plan, a number of different planning documents. And just with a focus on heat, see what net impact you were having on heat. And what they found in a lot of cities is that um, you know, in some places the, the, they were having a, a positive impact on heat, they were mitigating it. In other places they were having a negative impact unintentionally because of, they were focused on another hazard perhaps. And so just looking across all those plans and getting a good handle on uh, what was being accomplished was a really good step. And so now there, that uh, approach is being rolled out in a number of other places and there's a lot of interest to do more of it. Yeah, that's great to hear, Hunter. And, you know, we do have a lot of guidance, and I think this is one of the things that's great is that more guidance is, is emerging. But I'd like to hear maybe Gary and Nikki, what do you think? How do we translate this guidance to the vulnerable population so that they can take action? What are your thoughts on that? Maybe uh, Nikki first and then Gary. When you're talking about vulnerable um, communities, the Indigenous peoples are always part of that that group, I come from that group where uh, the poverty rate is below 40, is, is like, at, not below, it's at 40 or more percent on the Navajo Nation. 
but also remember that a lot of our community members are rural. So just having, being inclusive of, of that perspective is so important. I know what it's like to live without electricity, running water, and all, I think all of the other panelists, we all live in, um, in these uh, uh, urban areas. And I think to have that perspective, we need to really get down into the community and hear from the, the people. I think someone was talking about a community, meaningful engagement. What does that look like? It's not just taking surveys and handing out flyers and saying, we need your perspective. It's really getting to know the community that you really want to assist. So I'll, I'll stop right there for now. Thanks so much, Nikki. And Gary, I'm going to push you towards giving us some solutions here. Okay, quickly here. Uh, you, you, you know, it's it's all about capacity building. You know, and 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 with that, I mean, getting in, in community and just not informing them, just not consulting them, just not just not letting them know, but moving them towards empowerment, having ownership of, uh, of these issues. You know, that's 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 first and foremost. You know, and, and also, you know, let's let, let's move these. The, the, these uh, 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 cooling centers out of government control and into communities and build resilience hubs and such, you know, and have those hubs maintained by the community. So, so, so they're accessible, they're maintained, uh, they, and also that, that the community understands the importance of, of heat, of extreme heat as well. You know, and it's and it's also get, gets down to, to to the very homes in which those in which people live in. You know, a lot of people in 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 in, in underserved communities, you know, live live in not so nice housing. You know, it's not well insulated. You know, it was built before, so some of the latest codes, it's 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 old. You know, and and etc. So healthy homes. You know, we need to make make sure that 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 populations in those communities are living in healthy homes. So establishing healthy homes programs with with an emphasis on extreme heat. I, you walk around the community sometimes, you see a home with a single air conditioner, you know, it's stuck in the window. What if the air conditioner goes out you know, and, and, and it's a 90, 90 degree day? You know, another thing that we're doing quickly here is, is that we're, work, we're actually working with NASA data. You know, NASA o o opened up their, their information center today. Uh, and um, uh, everybody was there and such. And so, so we're, we're using NASA data from satellites, Earth science data and such. And we're gathering community folk together, you know, and saying, hey, you know, here's a way for you to mitigate your environmental justice challenges, you know, via using NASA data and such. And we, we've had two, two workshops so, so far and, we, and we're feeding back to NASA, you know, how can we empower these, these communities with, with your data, including extreme heat? Yeah, I love that. Thank you, Gary. So we've been talking quite a bit about um, how we address this lack of knowledge around indoor heat and temperature and thinking about solutions there. Let's spend a little time thinking about this cooling centers and evacuation facilities issue. Rupa, is this something that you've encountered in your work in California and any solutions that really come to the forefront for this? Yeah, so I guess I first want to start with some of the barriers that you um, discussed. Um, one of the biggest things is that we're really siloed. Um, even among the state workers, our state agencies aren't so great about working together. Um, and um, this is why it's so important to have conversations like what we're having right now, um, whether it's academics or government or um, you know communities, it's really important. Um, and like Nikki said, when we're talking about communities, not to just go pass out a flyer and put a questionnaire in and then kind of leave and not do anything about the issues. Um, the travel communities, unhoused populations, um, and outdoor workers are these high-risk populations that we just don't have data on. The indoor um, air also, um, or indoor temperature, excuse me, is really important, but it's expensive to get that data. Um, we need personal monitoring for that. That's why it's so much easier to do these large-scale studies. So. Um, as far as interventions go, we do have some heat action plans that, that we can learn from. Again, I don't think that those really capture uh, the root of the problem and it also doesn't capture the very vulnerable populations that are not included in these larger data sets, but it still gives us a start as to what we can do, what kind of interventions we can take. Um, as far as cooling centers go, um, Cecilia asked that question, I don't think that's um, been a, a, a valid solution for most places, but in some areas, especially in urban areas, that does seem to work um, just because they're more accessible. 
Um, you know, there's uh, libraries, um, I mentioned before movie theaters and, th and those types of things that people would probably visit anyway. But we have to think about areas that don't have these types of areas, um, rural, uh, semi-urban, um, you know, smaller communities. And, and that's where I think more of this work needs to be done. We've done a better job in urban areas just because that's where we have the data. We don't have the data in those other places. And um, that's where I see a huge gap. Okay, thanks Rupa, and over to Hunter. Yeah, I just wanted to add one thought about cooling centers and that is um, we often focus so much on the centers themselves and not on the people that are using them and, and who they are and why. And I think we need to think more about the, the groups of people that, it, that go to the centers. Anecdotally, I know it's a lot of, it's, it's groups of people like, first of all, the, the unhoused population, but then there's also another category, which is people who are poorly housed, um, older adults that that maybe feel like they can't run their air conditioning or something. So really getting more, uh, paying more attention to who's going and why they're going, you might be able to address different issues that are driving people to, to need to use cooling centers. Uh, when it comes to uh, poorly housed individuals, for example, or people who, who maybe don't feel like they have, who don't have air conditioning or don't have the, the means to run their air conditioning, that's that's potentially a different solution that you could implement as opposed to, you know, expecting them to go to a cooling center. So really kind of breaking down these issues a little bit more would be helpful. Thanks. And we have about 30 seconds left. I'll turn it over to Jessica. Thank you. I know we are trying to focus on solutions and not challenges, but I do want to mention that there are parts of the country where um, historically uh, public buildings have not needed to be climate controlled. So there actually is not a capability currently to do things like manage the air quality, manage the temperature inside buildings, buildings like schools, community centers, food shelves, even sometimes movie theaters don't have air conditioning systems because um, it pre previous to current times, they weren't needed. And so I think that there, there's a, a particular need to evaluate public spaces because we know from occupational hygiene and other practices that um, relying on engineering controls rather than administrative controls, which involve altering human behavior is more is more reliable. So control the climate in those spaces where humans spend their time anyway. Thank you so much. All right. Well, we're going to um, move on to the next set of challenges and um, hope audience is following along in Slido. And I'd like to invite uh, Juanita to come on screen and uh, present some challenges from the workers and economic productivity group we had yesterday. Thanks so much, Cecilia. Um, so my name is Juanita Constable and I'm with the Natural Resources Defense Council. A lot of the barriers we discussed in the workers and economic productivity session yesterday echoed what we've been hearing all through these main sessions. So I'll just group them in three broad categories. First, there are wide information gaps among and between employers, health and safety professionals and workers about the perils of heat and how to address them. So many workers aren't aware of their workplace rights. Many industrial hygienists don't have adequate training on heat, which was a big surprise for me to hear yesterday. And many employers don't understand that they'll save money by protecting their workers from heat. Second, even when workers and employers understand the health harms of heat, they may not have the tools to address them. Small business owners may not have the staff or the technological expertise they need to develop a robust heat emergency plan, or workers may be blocked from organizing themselves to collectively demand the protections they deserve. Finally, as Sonal Jessel talked about yesterday in the context of community members, if you have a problem with heat, you face a lot of other threats in your life. That means that even if a worker has the information they need, uh, and the tools to address the harms of heat, they may be afraid to use those tools. So workers may be afraid of being othered for being pregnant. They may be afraid of being deported to another country, back home to their home country that's unsafe for them or lacks economic opportunity. They might be afraid of losing the only job available to them. And these fears stem directly from the major institutional, structural, and economic forces that put workers, and especially low-wage workers of color, and or, uh, workers of color in harm's way, and keep them there. So we have this nested set of barriers at multiple scales that all contribute to one another. And my question is how we multi-solve, how we deal with these nested barriers in a holistic way that doesn't just nibble at the edges of the threat of heat to worker health and productivity. And who needs to be contributing to those solutions? 
and how do we best engage those contributors? Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, and why don't we start this one off with uh, Vivek, because we didn't hear from you in the last panel, if you're ready to respond. Um, sure. I hope my internet is also uh, stable, at least for these 30 seconds that I, I'm just quickly respond. This is really interesting, Juanita. Lots of um, work is happening in this area. I think one of the uh, things that comes to mind is that when we're thinking about innovative solutions, a lot of the uh, my definition of innovation is just old ideas that are put to new application. And in this case, things like um, things that have been around. IHEAP, these are the assistance programs, um, even federal agencies like FEMA, they don't recognize uh, heat. And in LIHEAP's case, they don't recognize summertime heat as a necessary. A lot of states who apply to federal agencies for those resources don't see heat necessarily as a direct uh, opportunity to shore up some resources. And that can be directly applicable to workers, to uh, municipal uh, to entities, and that could be a direct way to address some of the countervailing arguments that I've often heard from, from private agent entities that often say, you know, we don't have the money to be able to put in air conditioning, or we don't have the money to be able to do X, Y, or Z. And there are programs that I think do exist already where you can quickly um, uh, catalyze a lot of activity in terms of reducing exposure, particularly those workers who are in uh, outdoor workers. I'd be really curious to hear from others on the panel about uh, opportunities that might be available or innovations that might be available for uh, uh, getting at outdoor workers outside of uh, regulations, which is generally what I tend to go to. Jessica, I know you were in our group yesterday, but curious what your thoughts are um, among any of these themes of communication gaps, um, not workers not having tools and the sort of the fear of retribution that workers um, experience. You know, I, there's so much to say here. I want to start by acknowledging that these challenges are not unique to extreme heat. These challenges impact workforces um, with respect to a lot of different aspects of occupational health and safety. So there's that. Um, and that actually brings me to, again, the fact that we do have a lot of proven practices that I think we should um, tap into here when addressing the challenge of extreme heat and its impact on workforces. Um, uh, I know, Vivek, you had challenged us to think about solutions that are not regulations, but I do think regulatory framework is absolutely essential. Um, th there is a, a um, state heat uh, illness prevention standard in, in, Cal in California that I think um, is a really great example for other states to follow. Um, but we do also need a federal level regulation in place that specifies and requires mandates, specific programmatic elements to be put in place in workplaces. We don't have that. There's a lot of research out there about practices that are effective um, to address heat challenges in workplaces. We need to tap into the, the research and the learnings, tap into the best practices. There are lots of resources and recommended guides out there for how to implement a heat illness prevention program, but we need those program elements to be mandated by federal OSHA. Um, and again, there are great examples. And I want to point to respiratory protection programs as an example where federal OSHA has, has mandated specific program elements that help employers make sure that they are putting everything in place that they need to to effectively protect workers. Um, yeah. I can say a lot more, but I want to give other people a chance to speak also. Thanks so much, Jessica. And panelists, if you have a, a comment you'd like to jump in on, please raise your hand so I call on you. Otherwise, I'm going to kind of just go with it. Rupa, is that you? Coming off mute. Yeah, sure. I could just add to that. I um, completely agree with everything that was just said. One area that um, is often missed is mental health, especially with outdoor workers. Um, so we've done some studies now to look at heat and mental health. Um, and we know that the suicides and homicides and all these other mental health outcomes are actually elevated when um, temperatures um, increase. But High risk populations such as outdoor workers are often missed. Um, and I think we haven't talked about mental health and, and that whole aspect as much. Also, um, something that really needs to be addressed when uh, developing these um, action heat action plans. 
Thanks, Ripa. And uh, kind of pushing towards solutions, I think one of the big challenges we see in this area is, is big communication gaps. And so curious how this group has come up with solutions, maybe for other communication gaps, but how can we apply it here? Um, Jane, Nikki, Gary, any thoughts on how we really improve our communication to, to vulnerable populations, in this case being workers? Go ahead, Gary. Yeah, quickly here. You know, you know, the, 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 there's nothing more effective than, than a good old fashioned inspection. You know, so 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 let, let's have our inspectors not only look for for safety hazards, not only, not only look, look for trips and falls, but but also for 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 heat as well. You know, and and how we can do 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 better not only not only on outdoor construction sites, you know, but but also uh, uh, indoor manufacturing facilities as well. You know, it's about educating leadership, getting that CEO engaged, involved. You know, making him knowledgeable that hey, you know, this is effect, uh, affecting folks all the way down to the to the assembly line, and we need to do something about it. Elected officials, you know, they they're, they're typically not well educated in this space, you know. So so, so we need to push push uh, push push on those guys as well. Effective state local policy, worker rights. Um, also, we, we touched on laws and regulations. You know, the, 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 those need to be uh, amplified. And lastly industry operating experience you know it, it, industries keep keep uh, good records around histories of accidents histories of of um, of things going wrong in, in, in certain places etc cetera, etc cetera. you know so, so so now let's expand that to, to capture history around heat uh, and extreme heat it, its effects and share that as well again industry operating experience i love that any, uh, Jane, any thoughts to, oh, we have Je Jessica, why don't you jump in? And then Jane. Sure. So quickly uh, to your question about communication challenges, um, a basic practice we need to have in place always is understanding the languages that are spoken by the workforce and providing information, both uh, verbal and also written information via posters, placards in the languages of the workforce that is present. And then also I want to point out that um, one way to address communication challenges indirectly is to um, implement your controls in the form of everyday workday practices rather than training. So if you rely less on training and more on um, things the controls like uh, misting stations that are located there at the work site in the space where the workers are are spending their time, um, uh, constructed um, canopies, shade that is you know erected in the space where the workers are spending their time, enforced water and cooling breaks, buddy programs where no worker works alone. Those are our practices, very specific examples of practices that can be implemented. Um, that rely a little bit less on training and communication of the workforce itself. Thanks so much, Jessica. On the theme of communication, um, Jane and then Nikki. So I'm wearing a uh, sticker from a demonstration outside that says, Agua, uh, Sombra y Descanso. It's a campaign of workers that are looking for local heat protection ordinance. We've worked with them for three years trying to get a state level standard. And so now we're pivoting towards a local heat protection standard potential. We're exploring that. Um, but we, it, our heat season campaign to everybody's point was in three languages, uh, English, Spanish, and Haitian Creole. It all channels outdoor media, um, social media, but radio, the radio stations that we heard from our community members that the Haitian Creole speaking people listen to or the Spanish speaking people listen to. And and not just spots, but interviews, making sure that they're they're actually their people are representing and and, and getting the word out. Um, so I think that's really important. We did some that were specifically targeted towards outdoor workers so that we could reach out and, and are looking to partner with OSHA on a series of trainings this summer to engage employers on the issue so that we can try to, to Gary's point, try to get those the employers involved and engaged on the issue. Yeah, and, and and changing the narrative there maybe and saying, you know, healthy workers are productive workers, right? Well, because we when health declines, productivity declines, how do we frame this in the positive? You're um, you're actually when you're exerting energy over 90 degrees, your productivity goes down 50%. So uh, with just an hour out there. So if 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 you do take breaks though, if there is research that shows that you're more productive. 
There you go. Um, Nikki, over to you. I just quickly wanted to say that uh, I agree with Gary when he mentioned that educating the leadership, getting them on the ground. And that's something that we, we do or try to encourage in our work at ITEP is to have leadership, people in leadership levels, not necessarily the chairman or the president, but rather people who make these decisions or influence decisions to be to experience um, what it's like on the ground. A few years ago, I believe Senator Cory Booker went in the field to with the with the workers, and and many other representatives have done the same thing. But that kind of I think um, leadership is is needed to educate and show, you know, so they know what it's like, to, what it's like on the ground. And then uh, in the communication, one of the things that we promote as well is to, and somebody said it in the Slido, is to empower the community, empower those who are on the ground. I believe that we should see them as relatives, not just machines who create products or help um, out uh, with the product output, um, but see them as human beings. And that's something that I think should be in management 101. Um, so seeing them in a holistic way, right? I think uh, Juanita was saying that, how do we ha create these solutions in a holistic way? And one of those ways is, seeing, is going back to seeing our relatives who are in the field as just that, relatives, not just worker bees who, who help us um, create um, money. So anyways, I'll stop there. Thank you. No, you don't have to stop, Nikki. I think um, we have some more questions specifically for you. And I think, you know, bringing that indigenous perspective to this is, is, is really valuable. And one thing that's occurring to me is that workers actually do have a lot of knowledge about how, about heat and how do we bring, you know, indigenous knowledge or ancestral knowledge to the forefront. And I wonder if you have any experience with, with raising the profile of, of those types of practices and maybe it applies in this situation. I live in, yes, I live in uh, northern Arizona and um, in the area near Monument Valley, Lake Powell area, and we've been ex experiencing extreme heat, like over 100 degrees, which hasn't happened. I grew up herding sheep um, in the cornfields, and I don't remember ever it being like 95 degrees and above, but I'll tell you, I, well, I also live at 7,000 plus feet in elevation now, so I'm very spoiled. My mother still wears hats, long sleeve shirt, uh, jeans, you know, in a hundred degree heat. And they have these cooling centers and our cooling centers are uh, shade structures made from material off the land. And um, it is and under trees. And so we take care of our trees, juniper and pinion trees. And so just asking um, our, I, as we say in the indigenous way, our elders, our elders are monitor long-term monitoring networks and data. Somebody was saying that there's a lack of data in these uh, vulnerable, low-income, rural communities. We, and, and that's to your point, Cecilia. They, people are data, and we don't ask them enough. And that's what we're trying to continually um, promote in, at ITEP and with our other partners, that we've got to speak to the people. And I'll end with this. The Gila River Indian community, which is um, located south of Phoenix and Chandler, Arizona, they are also facing extreme heat. A lot of haboobs, you know, these huge dust storms and, um, and the lack of water. Uh, they are uh, creating traditional shade structures as part of their climate adaptation planning process. And rather than depending on the Western colonized way of the four wall structures, which most often, if you look on tribal reservations and communities are poorly built and they're not built to last, they're not built to retain heat or um, uh, uh, coolness. So um, asking the people what it's like and going back to that traditional way of creating these structures, which, which can help with uh, retaining heat or uh, cooling off our most vulnerable community members. Thank you. That's so cool, Nikki. Thank you so much for sharing. We have to move on to our next group now. Hunter, I see you and we'll come to you quickly. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to Anna.
to uh, present some some more challenges and, and let's focus on solutions. We're, we're making really great progress. Thanks to everyone. And thanks to those of you in the audience putting stuff into Slido. We really appreciate that. Over to you, Anna. So thank you, Nikki. I think that bridges perfectly into some of the discussion here. So we were health and health systems. And so um, we summarized this into three take homes, but I will say part of this, I've taken the liberty of building on. So the first one uh, you already heard is silos. So where knowledge is, who's missing from the conversation, who are the access, who, sorry, who are the actors, who has access to health and healthcare, and all of this is affected by trust, but it, leads to, I mean, this. the truth is, is there's this multifaceted intersectional work because in health, health is mental, physical, spiritual, emotional health. So it in, it actually, um, you know, correlate, like it links to everything that we've talked to here, um, but yet the healthcare system and sector is very siloed. And I think that like, this has just been underscored perfectly in this conversation, but we haven't uh, labeled it until in this last one, which is, you know, really we exist with our information, our power and our funding and our scientific method are all very colonial ways of thinking. We take a complex problem, we pick it apart, and then we try and measure and then we put it back together again. And like, that's not a very relational way of thinking. It's not helpful. And I think, you know, in healthcare, we're really with all of these fundamental pieces is a return to relationships, relationships with each other, with nature, with the environment. In, in the umbrella of planetary health, you know, really returning and trying to understand and support um, and legitimizing Indigenous knowledge systems as really important to our health and amplifying those voices. So I think there's definitely an opportunity for learning and recognition of, of Indigenous knowledge systems as, you know, knowledge keepers. But the barrier there is that it's not legitimized, it's not recognized. And even I think when people are well-meaning, it takes time to really listen, to learn to listen and understand. And the people who are affected by these systems are the speakers. So how can we enable healing and capacity to share that knowledge? I think is a huge piece um, that was brought in there. The second one is data. Um, and, you know, that's difficult to measure. You know, if you're, if you're talking about time points and there's a lag with heat and then there's chronic stress and what that is often misses people's human experience and human knowledge, the scale of the granularity of, of the pieces, getting real-time data. And I think a lot of it's focusing on benchmarking, but really we need to be working on action. We know things are doing. So how do you do all these things simultaneously and include these different perspectives and weight and knowledge to get that across? And then there's the communication. How do you disseminate it? How do you uh, counter um, in a way that's not defeating because there's some really striking health outcomes, um, countering disinformation. And, 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 you know, how do you also integrate the, the narrative of climate change in while you're doing this? Because that's really one of the causes. And then the third one is this, this chronic and acute response to heat in the health system, which we do not have. It's very reactive, not proactive. And often the solutions are outside of the health system. But even within the umbrella, do we have uh, heat emergency plans, do practitioners have conversations uh, and do medication plans and hot day planning? Are you are we linked properly to, you know, I think public health and health geography and um, uh, epidemiology are here. And then the, and that's where the knowledge is, but the frontline people, the people supposed to be having conversations are often the ones not connected to the community organizations, the activists, the people having these. And, and they're not, we're not as healthcare providers prepared um, and we don't have that knowledge. So just to sum it up, there's like three, I think, barriers. One is the silos. Um, and part of that is this healthcare system is like siloed itself from all of these other pieces and is trying to link back through. We've siloed indigenous knowledge and not highlighted and enabled it. The second is data and all the issues that around that about who has it, how we benchmark and not inhibit action. And the third is this preparation um, for the acute and chronic health system effects. Like those are basically non-existent. So it's a barrier, but the other barrier is the fact that we're trying to integrate this on an already overburdened stress system. Thanks so much, Anna. Okay, so let's uh, let's go to Rupa first for this one. Okay, I think um, you hit so many things right on the head, Anna. Um, but the thing that I want to talk about now is um, we are kind of in crisis mode. And that's why I think so much of our public health interventions tend to be short term. What do we do about it now? Um, even just 20 years ago, we would talk about something, climate change happening in the future. 
We don't have to worry about it quite yet, maybe in the next generation, but we're seeing now that that's not the case. Regardless of where we live, we're seeing impacts on climate change. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be thinking about long-term solutions as well, particularly, again, getting back to high-risk communities. What about things like building infrastructure? Um, what about um, enforcing some of the guidelines? Because especially when I think about farm workers, people know their rights, but they're not enforced. And so they maybe feel like um, not able to really take action, even though they know that there's, oh, I should be taking a break now. Um, but other people aren't taking breaks. And so maybe I would get fired because I'm the one that's doing that. Things like that. I, I think that we need to think about long-term solutions. I know that we're in crisis mode. I know that, um, we, you know, from epidemiologic studies, most of the health impacts are very short-term and acute. And that's why we need to act quickly, but we need to also plan ahead. Thanks, Rupa. So let's let's talk about solutions um, towards this. How do we get out of crisis and reactive mode? Um, and I'll turn to Jane next. Sure. Um, thank you. And I'm not going to address all the challenges, but one thing uh, we did, I co-chaired our task force with an internal medicine doctor who was a co-founder of the Florida Clinicians for Climate Action. Her name, Dr. Cheryl Holder. And she got involved because her patient who had COPD uh, came to her and asked for her to sign off to get her help with utility assistance. And that speaks to Anna's point of just the intersectionality of the challenges here. So Doctors, nurses, nurses in particular are our most trusted messengers out there. So we partnered, Cheryl Holder and I and our Baptist Health System and, and our health foundation on creating a continuing education series that train nurses, doctors on why is it getting more hot, both the climate change, urban heat patterns, who's most vulnerable and, and, and really talked about questions and how you tease out some of that chronic exposure, identify and understanding and reminding practitioners that, that how that could compound either medications they're on or pre-existing conditions they may have, understanding what their conditions are at home and exposure that might be at home as well. Um, and what resources they could help their patients with, with um, our utility assistance programs or knowing what, what rights a worker does have, even though they're limited here, um, but, but what their rights they do have. Uh, those were some of the, so that was just one solution that we put That's together. Okay. That's great. So thinking about education of health care workers, um, can, making sure healthcare workers know about what resources are available to their patients, right? And so they're well educated and can really step in. Um, that's really wonderful. And there were some other things there too that we've captured. Um, Nikki, over to you. Hi, uh, Nikki, you're muted. Sorry, thank you. Um, thank you for that synopsis, Anna. I really appreciate it. I just, I just want to say part of the solutions that we're trying to encourage and promote with, um, you know, our adaptation planning and our work, the health of the environment is very closely tied, interconnected with the people. We are not different. That, that is literally who I am. And if I did say my clan system that, you know, we are part of these clans, it's all about the environment and the animals and the plants. Our our whole being does not honor the New York skyscrapers or the Eiffel Tower or the Industrial Revolution. It honors our relatives, our non-human relatives, the wildlife, the plants, and the, the environment. So I really want to stress that. Um, part of the solution is acknowledging that all our healthcare officials on and off the reservations need to take into account that Indigenous peoples' healthcare does not include, always include a facility like Indian Health Service or Flagstaff Medical Center or, you know, and, and so on. Our healthcare comes from the environment. We have medicine people. I don't call them shamans, but we call them medicine people, men and women, people who are of the two spirit, who are medicine people that provide uh, prayers and ceremonies, um, emotional well-being 
um, practices. So that's a big part of it. Winslow Indian Health Center, which is right down the road from Flagstaff, years ago employed a medicine man. Um, and he was a traditional healer who actually worked with the elders um, and a lot of the community members whose first language was the Neh Navajo or Hopi. And so, and then that way they could also work with the um, people who had the title of doctor, um, the Western doctors. And that was so successful, but it's not a practice that is um, promoted. And there's some places that have that, but it's not widely um, not widely done. And I also want to make sure that I um, talk about the national climate assessment, the fifth one that's upcoming. The human health chapter, which I'm honored to be a co-author on, is promoting, or not promoting, including um, how there's an interconnectedness between the environment and the people. And that the emotional well-being of the people is directly impacted by the environment. And I'll end with this example. A relative in Alaska is um, has uh, long-term insomnia now because he doesn't hear the ice crashing because uh, the warming waters you know, near the, the waters that he lives near. And so he's, and, and also he's been very stressed out and has had some emotional uh, problems. And so nobody understands that. And he said, the only thing that can heal me is me being on the land and being near ice, which I, and he's like 85 right now. So taking that, those types of, um, taking all of that into account is important for those who are in the urban healthcare system. And, um, Indian Health Service is not the best, so have in edu educating doctors and nurses who come from urban areas to work on the reservations need to be educated that as well. So I per perhaps some of my co-authors are on this call and hopefully they'll comment as well. And I'll stop there, thank you. Thanks so much, Nikki. And uh, over to Jessica and then Gary, we gotta keep it quick because we're gonna move on to the next session soon. Thank you so much. I wanted to address the communication silo challenge. Again, this is another challenge that's not unique to the heat uh, situation. Um, I have seen what I have seen be effective here is partnerships between schools of public health and schools of medicine within university systems. Incredibly powerful to have both as part of the formal education of healthcare practitioners, but also as continuing education, have some crossover. Um, some cross-pollination of those, those two populations where public health folks who are learning in their fields and medicine professionals are learning in their fields. fields. There's some overlap of curricula, um, some interaction, some cross-disciplinary problem solving. We actually practiced that when I went through my school of public health here in Minnesota. Um, and then also on the continuing education point, there are programs, um, uh, funded public health continuing ed programs for uh, medical practitioners geared towards that audience, where I think extreme heat can be addressed to um, help increase access uh, to some of the knowledge that is sort of held within public health to make sure that it is accessed by um, healthcare practitioners. And then also on your uh, question about how do we get out of emergency mode? I honestly think that to an extent, we, we can't avoid the urgency of this particular challenge. Um, preparedness is the challenge for healthcare organizations, um, healthcare operations. And I think that we can learn from other uh, public health events and a lot of the preparedness lessons that we've learned, even from COVID-19 and other infectious disease outbreaks. How do we prepare hospital systems to be poised and ready to respond when a situation arises when you can't always predict that it will? Um, Unfortunately, we've struggled to, look to, to, to absorb some of those lessons learned, even from infectious disease outbreaks, but I think we should tap into them. They're available. Um, things like stocking the needed supplies and materials, um, implementing action plans, and holding emergency drills to make sure that everybody involved knows what to do when, when an, an, an emergency situation arises. Thanks so much, Jessica. And, uh, you know, the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education is exists solely for the purpose of educating health professionals. So um, we do a lot of courses and training events if anyone here is interested. We have one minute left for these questions, and I'll put it over to Gary. Okay, quick. Okay, quickly here. Um, we use it for to 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 break through break through the to, to break through the communications barrier. We use good old fashioned radio. Uh, we have a radio show called Why Our Community Must Care About Climate. 
And so, so, so we have we have health professionals, we have climate experts, uh, we, we have technologists uh, on 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 panel there and such. Some, some sometimes up to up to ten experts at, at a time. Again, talking about health, talking about climate, and talking about that intersection, which, which includes e e extreme heat. Again, why our community, why our community must care about climate. Next, we, we have a health and rewards program, uh, which, which, is, which is a continuous education program where if folks go in and, and they they they, 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 they take a quiz, they, they get rewards. They actually get cash for learning about things like extreme heat, which 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 affects their health. Next, if, if you're doing research studies out there, hey. Bring the community along with you. Let them ride in the car with, with the instruments and such and see the difference in, in, in tree canopies between wealthy sections and, and, and those less, less, less fortunate. And then lastly here, you know, we, we need to promote, as, as usual, the social determinants of health. We do that all day long through, 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 through social media and, and, and other means as well. Thank you so much, Gary. Um... We're going to move over now to our next set of challenges. And so I will introduce now uh, Allison to, to lead this session. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Turn off your computer. Is this going to work? OK. Um, I facilitated breakout group four, which discussed how rising heat affects overall well-being, um, as well as discussed various types of programming that can build social cohesion or reduce risks in other ways, uh, such as heat risk ed education, as well as barriers to implementing effective programming. We did, during our discussion, start surfacing some great solutions, but for the purposes of this discussion, I'll just highlight three of the themes among the barriers we identified uh, with some examples for each. So one thing that came up a, a, a number of times was uh, the problem of lack of training or in some cases ineffective training on how to implement programming that mitigates heat risk. So for example, lack of training among healthcare providers on how to identify and report heat related health impacts. Um, lack of training for teachers or caregivers on how to balance the need for exercise with the need to stay cool. Um, limited understanding of how to communicate in a culturally inclusive way or programming that does not adequately incorporate non-institutional or local knowledge and expertise um, or offer fair compensation of, of the participants. The second category uh, theme of barriers we talked about was the perception of individual responsibility. Um, people have often thought of heat as someone that, you know, an individual should really just deal with on their own. And a lot of the potential solutions out there, of course, are things that um, someone might only typically have access to if they're well off or part of a dominant culture, such as ability to pay for air conditioning um, or travel, you know, using a personal vehicle to a cool space. So the question being, how do we shift perception? of uh, cooling resources um, from uh, private resources to public resources and make them more accessible um, to folks who are at risk. And then the, uh, finally, the third theme of barriers we talked about was um, this uh, a narrow focus on heat as a standalone issue. Uh, because of course, people in communities at high risk of heat related health problems often face many other problems that contribute to or compound their risk from heat, such as air pollution or poor access to health care um, or poverty. Um, and they may not want to prioritize solutions that only address heat um, or, you know, being narrowly focused focused on staying in cool spaces. So the question is, how can communities develop programming in a way that honors intersectional needs and, and priorities um, and that addresses heat alongside other community priorities? Are there existing programs through which heat-related education or cooling resources can be offered? Thank you so much, Allie. And to our audience, we, we definitely want to hear from you as well. So please uh, use the Slido. Uh, you'll find the link in the chat again here. And maybe we'll open up this session with uh, maybe some reflections from you, Hunter. OK, okay. Um, I'll start by going back, actually, to the last two uh, categories, because I think the intervention I had was is applicable to pretty much all of them. And that is that I think participatory science is a really important uh, avenue for addressing the, the silos that were mentioned, for addressing the communications issues that were mentioned. That were that are uh, it's really useful for for bringing um, alternative um, thought processes and, and ways of of um, thinking about 
um, heat and its impacts into the scientific process. So I just want to put that out there. And you know, we've done that with the mapping campaigns that we run, but there are a lot of other ways of doing it. There are wearable sensors, there are the indoor sensors that were mentioned that were mentioned before. So, and then also qualitative ways of doing so by doing social science surveys and, and having other conversations with people. So I wanted to get that out there because uh, it's really, I think, um, one of the solutions to a number of these um, these issues. And then just a quick reaction to the, the idea of um, shifting that perception of individual responsibility. I think a lot of our messaging is targeted at individuals and we could do, we could make subtle changes to that messaging that would actually have really interesting impact. So instead of our social media uh, accounts all saying, you know, go drink water and, and seek shade and that kind of thing, we could shift the messaging to make sure that the people under your care have water, help your friends find shade, um, contact your, you know, anyone you know in your your family that might be at risk of extreme heat. So just kind of shifting that messaging would probably have a, a really big impact. Yeah, I, I really lo I love that, Hunter. Um, Vivek, do you have any thoughts on this one? Sure, and apologies that my camera's off. I want to make sure my voice is coming through clearly here rather than seeing my uh, face, which I think we've got your voice. Okay, um, just real quick, uh, part of what part of what I, I think this social cohesion issue is, and we are experiencing a national epidemic on isolation. I think the Surgeon General has written about this. We've seen a lot of uh, uh, publications and literature emerging more recently about this. And part of uh, what we're really trying to do in any of the work and what we're seeing over, over and over as solutions is really meeting people where they are, like not trying to bring heat right to uh, you know, the conversation, but really starting from where people are in terms of their experience of their place, what are the things they see every day in an, in an, around a neighborhood, around the farm, around any place where they spend time. And this is really, I think, one of a, 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 almost a no-brainer solution um, that feels not really innovative, uh, but nevertheless, given the kind of culture that we have of kind of uh, uh, attention seeking in every possible sense for every topic, I think part of what we're really talking about is how do we actually have authentic conversations with people in the, in the places they are, in the experiences they're having, and then take that as a means for trying to understand a bit more about how these different changes in the environment, including heat, intersects with the challenge of having a job and maintaining it, maintaining it, being able to get food on the table, being able to run and uh, pay the energy bill, et cetera. So that's really the approach that I've found to be most effective. And we've used that in everything from urban forestry to public health campaigns to uh, heat and, and even thinking about energy um, systems like heat pumps and air conditioning units. So I'll, I'll just, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Hopefully that came through better without my uh, camera on. Yes, it absolutely did. Um... Jane, over to you. Sure, so just picking up on a couple things um, Hunter said in terms of participatory science, we have had a long time partnership with our universities and community-based partners place iButton sensors throughout our community. And then this last round we added in, and I see one of our partners right there on the screen, Baritha Howard, but, um, uh, we've also now worked with the schools to, to Nikki's point or at someone's point about schools and, and making sure the education uh, system understood the students are now looking at the different heat and humidity in different parts of their schoolyards and what that means and also reporting on how they're, how they're doing. Um, I definitely have shifted messaging from just individual responsibility to think about if you know think about your employers not only your loved ones but your employers people you serve if you if you have a retail or restaurant operation make sure water's available you know that just different things that everyone's thinking about their neighbor in some way rupa i see some head nodding there anything to add yeah i agree with what has been said again um the two basic if i could break it down into two categories health education and public health messaging. And health education in includes everything from elementary school kids to um, healthcare practitioners, to the general public, to high-risk communities. Um, I think it's so important to make, really make that connection between the heat and symptoms 
um, many times that is not made. So for example, if there's some kind of lightheadedness or dizziness, it might be attributed to other things, but not the heat. And so then it's, uh, I think different interventions would be made based on what you think the root cause is of this uh, of these symptoms. Um, with public health messaging, um, heat alerts, uh, fact sheets, um, getting this message across to vulnerable communities. But what I've seen so far, and of course there's been improvement, but public health messaging is so important because heat advisories right now do not include all high-risk populations. So many people don't even know that they're at increased risk don't know that they should be taking any kind of precautions. And that even includes populations such as the elderly who are maybe don't have any pre-existing diseases, but just because the fact of their age could put them at higher risk and um, or certain medications that, might, that they might be taking. So I think that's really important is to talk about who is at risk and convey that message to the people who are at high risk and also their caretakers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Nikki or Gary, any thoughts on this? Well, you know, you know, it, what 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 really comes to mind, you know, again, is this intersection between community uh, and, and and the local uh, health infrastructure and the medical schools, et cetera. You know, you know, you know here here in Hampton Hills, Virginia, we we we've all come come together in, in a collaborative. And where we exchange, we do projects together, uh, we we uh, uh, do 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 uh, community-based campaigns. In other words, we're deliberately tearing down these silos, you know, and and and, and we do it in a very very structured manner. Con con continuous so social media, outreach and education campaigns, uh, for, for formulating sub subcommittees, uh, sharing uh, knowledge on, on upcoming web. Webinars again, continuously educating our staff, but but again, having that fruitful, meaningful engagement so such that we can reach out into communities and make a real difference. And over to you, Nikki. Thank you. I just wanted to add that for many of our communities, not just Indigenous, we have community gatherings, we have home multi generational households. And taking that into consideration when you're thinking about solutions um, and support for the community in emergency situations and making sure that all of these community members are informed. Um, for indigenous people, a lot of our you know, traditional indigenous healthcare is ceremonial. You know, we have multi-day ceremonies. We also have multi-day gatherings and the traditional way of making decisions was done in a community, but also in the matriarchal uh, system where all the women, the, the ones who give birth and raise the children uh, primarily were the decision makers. And, and also in recognition of our LGBTQ two-spirit relatives who are also healers they are also our health, our, part of our healthcare system. So when you're talking about, when we're talking about social uh, cohesion, I think that is something that needs to be acknowledged time and time again. You know, with this colonized Western framework of a patriarchal system, that's fine, but that, yeah, that, I mean, not, not fine. And it's fine if they are inclusive of the matriarchs and the two spirit, and it hasn't been that way. So part of our social network within these indigenous communities is being inclusive, inclusive of all genders and, um, and making sure that you respect and acknowledge these ceremonial systems that are part of our healthcare. And so that's what all the Western healthcare providers need to understand when you're working with indigenous people, whether they live on reservations or off reservations, tribal communities, um, but there's a large urban indigenous uh, populations like in Duluth, Minnesota, Los Angeles, you know, these huge urban areas and they get forgotten, but that's, you know, I just want to mention that. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki. And we're about at the end of this session, but maybe um, we could just go around this panel and just give sort of a, a one sentence um, thought or or idea of, of, of where you see the most bang for our buck in terms of solutions. Um, we'll start with Hunter. 
Uh, I would target it at this particular convening and uh, the committee that that brought us here. And I would say, don't stop here. Um, I've been in a lot of conversations um, like this. I always learn a lot from these conversations. Um, but it's really important that we, you know, we've we've discovered a number of different um, sort of avenues, categories we could go down. We could have days of conversation about each of these, and we probably should. And so my, I would just want to end with with that. I think we'd really just need to keep going and, and get deeper into some of these issues to have some results. Great. Uh, Rupa, 10 words or less. Sure. <laughs> I think the message is clear, uh, more community engagement, and we know what that looks like. There's a lot of mistrust of, and maybe rightfully so, of outside groups. doesn't matter who we are. We always tend to just trust our community more. So I think that's the, the message that I'd like to end with. And Jane? I'll just build on that, that, that solutions need to be developed from across sectors, across, across expertise, so that you, you do get those transdisciplinary solutions. Okay, Jessica? I was gonna say the same thing, an inclusive approach to decision-making, both in building programs and also addressing crises when they arise. Great, Gary? Lead with equity. Meet people where they are, ensure meaningful engagement, move towards empowerment. Nikki. The inclusion and the insertion of in indigenous traditional knowledges in all uh, decision-making processes. Well, I, uh, I can't thank this panel enough for your thoughtful and rich contributions. This has been really fun, exciting. I think we've got a lot of material here to work with. We've been capturing all of these solutions and we've put them into the Slido. And for the next five minutes, we want our audience to upvote the solutions that they feel like could be most impactful because the top 16 of these are going to become the discussion points for our next session after we come back from this quick break. All right. Sorry, 10 minute break. We're gonna reconvene at 2.45. So get your coffee, um, get your water and uh, upvote the solutions that, uh, that speak to you. And we'll see you back here soon. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Nambi Duga, she, her pronouns, and I am with KFF's Racial Equity and Health Policy Program. So the goal of today's breakout sessions are to consider the proposed innovative and future looking solutions that were upvoted in Slido and discuss potential wild cards or obstacles that could hinder the implementation of such solutions. The solutions shared cover many different and interconnected avenues of addressing the threats of extreme heat, including seeking to address, improve upon the built environment, sharing and leveraging the expertise and knowledge from local communities and engaging meaningfully with them improving heat-related data collection, translation, and distribution, and overall developing holistic, cross-sectoral, and decolonized solutions. So each breakout group will discuss the four solutions assigned to, assigned to them. As you look through the solutions and consider which breakout rooms you participate in, we suggest that you push yourself outside of your comfort zones and join rooms that stretch and challenge you. If you notice breakout rooms with far fewer participants, we ask that you join these rooms to facilitate a more robust discussion. In addition to being presented on the Jamboard, the solutions will also be added to the chat. So the goal in your rooms will be to push the collective thinking toward a more resilient set of actions or implementation strategies in the face of sudden challenges or uncertainties. These challenges can run the gamut of experiences, including disease outbreaks, power outages, technological malfunctions, extreme weather events, mass shootings, political instabilities, sociopolitical and economic movements, and others. So while you're in the room as your wonderful selves, you will also discuss how you could promote a change of narrative. We encourage you to be innovative and creative in your approaches. What we have not think about what we have not thought about to improve and prioritize disproportionately impacted communities. What is still needed to mitigate and adapt to the health effects of climate change? How do we leverage the evolving technological landscape? And how can we account for these uncertainties? How are indigenous groups and knowledge bases being centered in these spaces? And who is missing from these solution making spaces? And how can they be equitably and safely included? 
I would like to emphasize that you will get to decide which room you want to attend and the rooms are being posted in the chat. You will have the access to the chat function and will be able to use it to contribute to the discussion and provide ideas for innovative solutions and also be unmuted if you want to contribute verbally. We ask that these options are used wisely and that you keep your comments short and targeted. So to reiterate, for each solution and action provided, we also ask that you provide an actor or actors and partners as needed. Who can act on these solutions and who needs to be a part of these solutions? So thank you so much, guys. Um, I look forward to discussing these solutions and trying to navigate the different challenges that we have in the different breakout rooms. Please refer to the chats for all information. All right. All right. I think we have enough uh, thumbs up that we can move forward. <laughs> OK, let's 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 approach this in this way. I'm going to go through the and Daniel's on. Shall I, yeah. shall I share my uh, the breakout, the. Uh, the the solution. Yeah, great, great. I was just going to do the same thing. Please okay. go ahead. So we're going to go through the four solutions that were that were identified for our breakout. Okay, why don't uh, we approach this by going through all four and then giving a moment for any overall reflections and then we'll go back into each one to talk about whether it makes sense to tweak it or um, expand on the actors, the agents, uh, future proofing questions that we were assigned and then um, vote again. So the first solution is um, we need to address the built environment. That's the solution for um, uh, the built environment. Work with nature, not against it. There are many small things we could be doing that would greatly reduce the impact of heat involving city planning, architecture, et cetera. Again, I'm just going to go through all four of them first, and then we can come back to each one and wordsmith them a little bit. Solution two, real-time sensor technologies for indoor and outdoor heat joining data and lived experiences. Solution proposed. Number three, increase OSHA heat safety rules, um, which may, let's, I'm going to keep going through all four of them. <laughs> um, that includes national mandates and preempting state variations. And solution proposed number four, health education from elementary school all the way through um, communicating to high risk communities. So um, if I can be the first in this group to, um, make some overall, provide some overall thoughts. It would strike me that solution number three is better attuned to breakout room number two on workplace um, uh, uh, heat exposures. Um, and that number four is better attuned to breakout room number four, which is the social programming. Um, but I will, I will pause there and say, ask if there are any other comments around that either are in conflict with those um, thoughts or um, any other overall thoughts. Anybody in this breakout room? And I can't unfortunately see. So Laura, if you can see if somebody has their hand raised or wants to comment or is putting something in the chat, um, it's not coming up on our, on our, on our Zoom. Absolutely. I'll make sure to copy any comments that are in the chat to the Jamboard um, and any verbal comments I'll also make sure to copy onto the Jamboard and let me know if I can help with anything else. Thanks, Laura. So, um, and Daniel is here uh, taking notes in the group too. So Laura and Dan are here. Uh, so somebody named Roy um, from Pennsylvania DOT just raised his hand or uh, yep. their hand. Roy? Their hand is fine. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm working for um, PennDOT, and I, I agree kind of with solution two and four, maybe belonging somewhere else, but in Pennsylvania, we have an interagency health equity team that has about 12 different level state agencies working together to address critical health issues across the state. So from a state level perspective, um, all of these might fall into the state health department, transportation, um, community and economic development basket of tools. We've been trying to overlay um, five-year plans to uh, address some of these and we're updating our climate action plan in Pennsylvania. So uh, this 
is of particular interest to me because my partners and the other agencies couldn't attend today. So um, I'm okay wherever you want to move them, but I have thoughts on all of them. Right. Um, and let, let me, uh, Roy, if it's okay, I'm going to uh, ping you a little bit more. Uh, PennDOT, I'm assuming, is Pennsylvania State Department of Transportation. That is correct. Yes. Okay. Um, so given that the the quality of transportation in the built environment and potential heat. Is there anything in particular the transportation office is looking at? So we have, um, I'm working in a niche within the, within PennDOT from the governor's policy office. And one of the things that we see as a, as a challenge is um, our transit. So the, we have a number of different smaller and larger transit entities in the state, um, especially in the urban and suburban areas, we do tend to have fixed route transit and our bus stops are a challenge. Um, in many places, the bus stop for a long list of reasons is a post in the ground. And um, during heat emergencies and in the summer, those are not wonderful places to be waiting for the bus, especially um, for people in disadvantaged communities who have a whole constellation of issues to deal with besides um, transit. So that is that is one piece of it. Um, we're implementing an active transportation plan. We're working very hard to get um, our 2,500 townships and 2,500 municipalities and 67 counties thinking about um, active transportation, walking, biking, and rolling in terms of reaching community resources. So when we're thinking about, they're doing that in an unprotected environment. How do we do that with the, the street trees, with the sidewalks, um, with places to rest, with access to, to shelter and things like that. So there's a lot in here that I think would be useful. Um, and Maybe, in terms, go ahead. Yep, and I, I was just gonna ask you, so a lot of the conversation that we had in this, prior session was around um, planning and building the knowledge and research base. So I'd like to push us as a group to think a little bit more about solutions that would come, mm -hmm. uh, not just the plan um, yep. being the end, but then the projects that would come out of it. So from your perspective in PennDOT, and I'm sorry to keep harping on you, Roy, but so far you're the only one who stepped up in this, in this breakout room. It, it, what are the what are the solution sets? For example, for the challenge that you identified of people waiting for buses, um, mm -hmm. And oh, great, Hunter has raised his hand, so we'll come to you in a second, Hunter. But let me just sure. finish the thought with Roy. The, have there the, have there been actual proposed interventions? Yes, um, we have created a, a publication called "Build a Better Bus Stop," which walks through um, at a very basic level um, the, the ADA requirements, um, the legal requirements is the ownership of the sidewalk, the ownership of the physical bus stop itself, um, and the placement of the bus stop for like access at four corners of um, an interchange where you would best do that um, so that you have a series of best practices to design something that's safe and comfortable for the users. Um, that's one piece of it. The other piece is to try to get um, our transit partners to start thinking about that as they're doing their plans. We don't, we advise and we're a pass through for dollars. We are not in charge of the transit systems themselves. So um, there's a lot of education pieces here. And I think that as we get through the state climate action plan, um, addressing some of these issues cross agency is gonna be really helpful in getting the messaging out there. So that's the, right. the big one. Thanks for being our guinea pig here, Roy. Um, and so before we pass it to Hunter uh, for your thoughts, Hunter, I should note Laura has uh, reminded us that we're not focusing on the same physical interventions as yesterday's breakout groups. Um, we're, we've been given a whole new set of solution sets. So there are things that potentially Daniel and I aren't experts in um, that we'll be hearing. So we're just here to listen to you all. So Hunter, you're on. Thanks. I just want to lean into number two. I hate to be the sensor person always talking about it, but um, urban areas are really poorly observed and it's not just urban areas, um, rural areas are too. And so I think the, the data challenges we're facing, characterizing heat risk, 
um, in part stem from a lack of, of observational data, empirical data. Um, and so I just want to make sure that, that that we're really emphasizing this as one of the needs is just really in increasing the observations that are available of many kinds, observing different variables, different different ways of, of observing. Um, it's the where uh, brought them up in other sessions already, but the wearable sensors and the indoor and outdoor, and this is a really important thing for us to address because um, <clears throat> you know the the program that that we've been running through NIHIS has. Um, has made a, a dent in this issue, but a very small one uh, because it's such a large issue. So uh, just leaning into that a bit. If I may, um, I'm curious, it, it, the um, the program that you're talking about running is called, heat, is it, you're talking about re, Heat Watch, is that correct? That's what Kappa Strategies calls the, the program, yes. Yeah, so I was curious, um, you, you know, I kind of struggle with this in terms of what happens after, you get the grant to to map your city. Uh, it maps it for a day. Um, it primarily maps outdoor temperatures and humidities. And so, is there thinking within the program that it's going to become perhaps more comprehensive, or both indoor outdoor, or uh, maybe starting to prioritize the indoor along with the outdoor now? Or what's the thinking at NOAA here? We would love to do all of those things. Yes. Um... And I think in general, you know, another uh, much better funded example is the Department of Energy and their integrated field laboratories. There are four of them now um, that are just getting spun up, but they're taking place in, in communities across the U.S. And um, they are they are really going into uh, an elaborate um, set of experiments and and um, you know, community engagements that involve a lot of different observational types, not just a one day um, community science or citizen science sort of snapshot. Um, so those are, those are those kind of, they kind of represent the two uh, ends of the spectrum in terms of the kinds of observations and the, the level of intensity you can, you can get to. And I think we need to kind of um, find a, an approach that works in a lot of different communities. You know, we've, We've reached a lot of communities with a very small and manageable program. They're reaching uh, a few communities with a very big program. There's a lot in the middle there that we can do. So uh, we'll come back to the sensor uh, conversation, but I do want to pass it. There's another hand raised from Robert, Robert Suksi, or- Hey, all, Suksi, but close enough. Actually, Suksi. we can go back to the sensor talk right now, because that's what I was raising my hand about. Um, I'm good. So, this and can you identify where you're coming from, Robert? Oh, yeah. I'm an epidemiologist at the Rhode Island Department of Health, um, and I primarily work in environmental health stuff. So there's a reason why I'm going to the sensors. Um, in a different webinar recently, a lot of the talk that I was seeing was about wearable and personalized sensors. Um, and so I've been kind of, this is something I've been mulling over since that last webinar, I'd love to hear from you guys about, we're kind of at this point where we're starting to set up useful urban sensor networks so that we're able to understand the distribution of outcomes across cities. But as we're doing this, we're further understanding how that might be significantly different than the individual exposome of a person living in that environment. And also given how much of our exposure is indoor versus outdoors, um, what is the value of these sensor networks? And as someone who is looking to set one of those up in our state, it's something which I think is still valuable, especially because, if, for example, with heat stress, if it's hot outside, even if it's not the same temperature inside, you're going to have to be taking actions in order to respond or to mitigate your own exposure, which limits what you can do. However, there, that still means that there's going to be an discrepancy between the individual exposure and what we can capture in a useful sensor network. Um, and I don't know, I just love to hear if anyone knows about any work into putting together individual personalized exposome data, say through wearable sensors, along with sensor network data to see how they compare, or if there are behavioral changes that you could ease out of that. Sorry, does that make sense to other people? It's just been something that I've been rolling, so. It's a, it's a technical question about the interconnection between personal sensors and sort of outdoor fixture networks of sensors. Is that correct? Yeah, and how we can 
utilize <clears throat> both side by side while still understanding their limitations, especially because with the personalized ones, a lot right. of the build out of capacity, those are primarily going to benefit people who can afford an Apple Watch is kind of what it is now, um, which obviously goes against the health equity stuff. I don't know if Hunter, your hand has continued to be up or if you have any feedback. Yeah, I was going to offer a little bit. So in terms of the value of, of um, non-wearable sensors, which is, I think, one of your first questions, um, a lot of the solutions don't follow people around. And so if you're planting trees or um, doing some sort of a smart surfaces of implementation, that's going to be in a fixed location. And so it still makes sense to be able to have fixed location sensors, um, especially, and this is something that's really important, that's just not, it's not been done enough. Um, sensors that are evaluating the long-term outcomes of a lot of these interventions, we have such poor data, such poor evidence on what these outcomes are and what how lo long-term the effectiveness of a lot of these approaches that we're, we're trying to implement for, um, for heat. And it's not just about sensing um, environmental parameters. It's also about social science studies. There's such poor evidence about um, the effectiveness. I'm, I'm drifting a little bit here, but the effectiveness of different approaches to, to warning and, and alerting um, there's just so much research that needs to get done. Uh, and a lot of it's on the social science side as well. So I don't want us to lose sight of that. Um, as for connecting the sensors, I also want to not maybe answer your question, but add one more consideration, which is the quality of the observations. You know, if you have fixed location, um, really high quality observational networks, how do you connect them to the lower cost sensors and make sure that everything's been calibrated and they're, they're kind of feeding off of each other so that you you have a good estimate of the uncertainty of some of those lower cost sensors. If I can, if I could push all of you who are discussing the sensor technology. So there, there is a, Laura has put in some interesting provo provocations in the chat around this, but I, I would also, about the, the implementation challenges, who are the actors, where would this not work, et cetera. But I would also push you all to think a little about what the sensor, what challenge the sensors are actually solving. Is it simply information to measure all of the other potential interventions that we've been talking about? Or is there another outcome of interest that we're looking at that comes from the sensors? So for me personally, I'm kind of thinking of it from two perspectives. One is leaning into the temporal trends that you can get from a sensor in order to identify for surveillance things with heat specifically in mind. If we're having elevated time frames that we see are related with heat, can we use that to preemptively make heat warnings? But also with the spatial aspect of it, due to the heterogeneity within cities of the built environment, you're gonna have heterogeneous temperature zones. And so this helps us identify which parts of the these locations might be more vulnerable and therefore a better place to say, implement a cooling station or aim communications. So I think those are the, for me, at least those are the two obvious which, which I'm currently looking at it, but I'd love to hear other ones. It's helpful to know that we're talking about this as a means to other interventions, right? Because it's not just mm -hmm. the information about the heat themselves. Is there, a, I don't know if um, Hunter, you wanted to comment on that question too. When you combine the data you collect with uh, stories from people, it makes for a really powerful narrative. So it's also a really important communication tool, uh, really important for advocacy for um, catalyzing change. And um, that's one of the ways that, that I see it used all the time. I guess, I guess maybe somebody who's coming at this from uh, not quite the lay perspective, but a very different um, perspective in the housing world. I mean, we know when it's hot and we know the stories that come out during heat waves. So what, what, are we talking about that would be different, qualitatively different? And mm -hmm. there's a hand raise. So I'll, 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 Julie Hantman, I'm going to pass it to you in just a second. But if anybody who has been either Robert or or Hunter, you want to respond to that? I, I would just say that it it's been really powerful to see the temperature differences in any city that we've worked in. Um, and to line it up with uh, a, a redlining map or a, some sort of environmental justice map, it just often it just is very stark. Um, and that 
that's still extremely valuable for telling that story, even even if you're kind of hearing it firsthand from people, seeing it as well is is so valuable because you know he's the invisible killer, the silent killer. It's another way of of making it clear um, what these impacts are. All right, Julie Hansman, if you can yeah. identify yourself and your organ or your affiliation. Sure, thanks. Uh, I'm in DC. I'm uh, actually switching into the adaptation and resilience field, so I don't have an appropriate organization at this point. Well, I'm realizing you can't go into uh, detail about the large uh, universe of, of data um, issues here on, on relevant to this issue. Could you nonetheless please clarify? Um, the sensing data versus other kinds of data sets that are gathered. I take it that sensing data is this granular uh, effort to um, really gain the micro changes by, by being either worn on someone's body or otherwise. Uh, could you please confirm that and also clarify how that fits into the uh, ecosystem of data collection? And Julie, can you help elaborate who you're directing that question to? Oh, gosh, anyone who can answer it. <laughs> that would not be me. I can take a shot. Uh, <laughs> so when we when we talk about uh, temperature and particularly uh, urban heat islands, uh, we're looking for heterogeneous patterns within a typically within a city. Um, it turns out that we don't have holistic coverage of temperature in these locations, and so sometimes we use what are called remote sensing techniques. So satellites can look down and tell you what surface temperature is, but not necessarily what the, the air temperature is. And the air temperature is typically what people experience. Um, so to get around that, we use in situ sensors. Uh, some of them are gold standard sensors. So you, you can think about National Weather Service, NOAA type sensors, but they're often uh, few and far between. Um, and so we supplement those with uh, what we can sometimes refer to as cheap sensing technologies. And uh, cheap sensing technologies are informative, but they're not our gold standards. Um, but taken holistically, all of these uh, all of these different technologies can tell us things about the heterogeneities within a city. Uh, the Heat Watch campaign that I mentioned before, and that Noah or in that uh, the hunters talked about, is a very specific campaign where cities apply for funding uh, to have a uh, a consultancy agency come in and map temperature on one summer day. Uh, and so they fit cars and then they drive the cars around three times a day uh, and tell you what the temperature is all over your city. Uh, and so these are all different uh, forms of, of sensing. Uh, and this is kind of the constellation that we're talking about. Uh, and we're getting down even further now to individual exposure where people would put a sensor on their body and walk around with it and tailoring solutions and interventions using each of these individual data sets will get you different answers. Um, and so a great way to um, improve your city's urban heat island, if you're constraining your urban heat island using uh, surface temperatures is to plant trees, but that's surface temperature. It's not necessarily air temperature. And so these are considerations that we have to uh, make depending on the data that's available to us. Thank you. So we've, um, uh, with the three minutes that we have left, I believe in our in our time here, we've we've only focused on solution number two. Um, I do wanna, if anybody in the breakout um, who's attendant wants to talk about one, three or four, please raise your hand. Um, otherwise, I will ask those who have been participating on the sensor question, ah, we have one. Um, we need to start talking about actors very quickly. So Matrini, Weaver, if you can identify yourself. Um, yes. And let us know which, which of the solutions you want to talk about. We can hear you, Matrini. Sure. Um, I'm currently deployed for Hurricane Ian in Fort Myers, Florida with FEMA. So um, I have a concern about the, the EJ community that you know, even like old folks and people are going to have a have problem for the heat wave. So to my view, you know, the heat wave is going to be there, you know, no matter whether you're going to have layers and layers data, it's just a trending, you know, for the climate change. It's unavoidable. It's going to get warmer and warmer. So I think uh, what I would like to see and the actors is, uh, is there any emergency locations for folks that having health problem, you know, that's more likely 
to be provided or is there going to be household supporting system between neighborhood so how people can help each other by the time that the heat wave coming no matter you know whether going to randomly what happened with texas right now or maybe like tornado just like popping here and there like a popcorn so i guess you know that's more um doable i think needed and to be you know to be to be done not only just interventions of technology or policy but um what we're going to do on the ground itself so that i would i would like to propose that idea to be into action of what to consider um and and certainly many of the challenges that were identified yesterday um that speaks to those is there any we have one minute left is there anybody who wants to add any a, a new uh proposal or any elaboration on the four proposals that we have in this breakout group we see a lot uh happening in the chat so that's good it will make sure we have that documented Otherwise, I believe we're yeah. resorting to a five minute break according to the agenda. And I think everybody who's in this breakout room, you can stay here because this will become the main room as well. So you don't need to transfer um, your rooms. But otherwise, uh, we'll see you officially in five minutes. So now we can go into just the uh, hearing from the different facilitators if they have, um, if they can give a two, three minute summary of what they discussed. The big Holes and takeaways. Um, so, if we can go to room one, who who is the who wants to speak? Hello from room one. Um, our discussion mainly focused on two particular items. The first was uh, sensor technology, um, and the sensor technology and kind of the difference between um, various forms of sensing technology. And the the large the dearth of indoor sensor technology and how to improve that, uh, which federal partners are working in those different spheres, uh, and then we actually got quite granular with a a second solution that was discussed and that had to do with bus stops, um, and the built environment, and in particular reducing heat exposure at bus stops. Um, and so following the framework that was uh, provided to us, if, if we're thinking about a better design of bus stops, in terms of the partners that are responsible for that, um, we talked about uh, the departments of transportation at, at various levels, um, also zoning committees and uh, community groups that could be used to identify particular bus stops in need of help. Uh, in terms of essential actions, we talked about the idea uh, at least in the particular case of, of one state, of an umbrella directive that's um, that's coming from a, a state climate action plan. And so the need to develop a state climate action plan um, that will then influence the myriad agencies that are required to make this a better situation. Um, I don't think we got into future-proofing that particular item, um, but in terms of accounting for vulnerable populations, um, this was the impetus of this discussion. Um, the idea that many of these bus stops are, are not in good neighborhoods um, or, or neighborhoods that are in need in, of uh, resilience building. And lastly, the, the strategy or the communication strategy here uh, was largely driven by the state climate action plan and how that all encompassing document will trickle down to the various agencies that will be responsible for making this a better situation. Thank you. And I'm happy to pass to room two if needed. Yes, here we are. Um, hi, everyone. So we had a pretty wide ranging conversation. Um, one of the themes that kept coming up over and over again was the concept of bringing um, uh, bringing corporate partners into the conversation. Um, whether that be incentivizing good behavior amongst partners or uh, uh, corporations that want to be part of the solution, um, or whether that be making sure that there's a way to get um, 
resources into the hands of communities on the front end. So if they want to uh, do heat improvements, that um, there's a way to structure it so that community members don't have to buy what they want and then get reimbursed afterwards. Um, so that would be, there would be a lot of, a, there'd be a big role for private partner, private public partnerships there. Um, another theme that came up is that uh, for all of the solutions we discussed, which was, um, or for, sorry, pardon me, the, the two main solutions that we discussed that were sort of home and neighborhood related, that renters often get left out of the conversation. And so solutions have to be geared not just at homeowners, but making sure that there's options um, to for people that are renting where they live um, and not owning them. Um, we talked a lot too about um, information flow between communities and um, various governance levels. So for example, um, creating places for communities to share the success stories that they've had and basically empower each other with the um, solutions that they've been leading at home. But how do we make sure that everyone has access to um, those kinds of, of uh in the, those kinds of stories. So we talked a little bit about ways to have reporting apps um, or tools that might be housed um, by a government body, such as um, looking at you, National he uh, Integrated Heat Health Information System, um, but would actually be co-developed with communities and they would be the ones who would be um, Community members would be the ones that would be selecting what's important to share, not having some expert arbiter at the top. Um, we didn't really get into the future proofing thing because we were so excited about talking about how to make each one of these things happen. But one thing that one communication strategy that kept coming through again and again, um, as we've heard the last two days, is just the importance of stories and how this can't just be um, techno speak. We have to talk in a language and in a manner that people uh, intuitively understand and are used to actually using in their own lives. Sabina, anyone else want to add any summary? I think you did a really wonderful job summarizing. Thank Why? you. Um, only thought I want to add is that I think we had a conversation a lot about uh, federal housing for these programs and if that's the best place um, and if so, how they can collaborate with communities um, in new and inventive ways so that we're increasing discussion across multiple levels of government. Thank you. Sorry, I'm using the wrong mic. Um, I think I'm next. So um, we are the third group, which was, you know, we only got to two of our um, solutions. Um, the first was around um, national weatherization programs and um, repair programs. And I think, you know, the main main things there are that, I mean, we need to be future thinking the data that all of these programs need to be based on future projections and current projections and need to be constantly updated, um, which, uh, you know, uh, we were told that often they aren't. Um, and that they really need to be incentivized and implemented at a local level. So regardless of political wins, um, and they're not sort of corporate held and led, but they're actually within communities. Uh, having data, um, oh, sorry, I said data flex. And I think the other piece is framing these as a health issue. And I think that also was helpful in terms of when we had a long list of essential partners and really thinking at an intersectional level when identifying partners um, and including health sectors and social justice sectors as well, especially for the accountability to um, you know, traditionally marginalized or underrepresentation populations. And then the other one that we talked about was the, um, you know, it was about education for fossil fuels and adaptation that doesn't inhibit medica mitigation. And that was really a conversation about health messaging, framing um, this as a health crisis, which has been ongoing, um, and then disseminating education across uh, and putting in, in policies as well that then protect those um, that are more vulnerable. So thinking of it like other public health crises. So we're talking about advertising. We're talking about um, hot day policies for schools. Um, you know, sports organizations having um, quotas for when to change outdoor activity. 
Um, and then also there was a very well um, stated point that we also have to think about, you know, emotional and mental well-being um, when we're thinking about this. So having intentional conversations that include include those aspects and dimensions when we are having um, when, when we're promoting this through edu education as a delicate balance. So that's where we got to. And I will hand it over to group four. Hi, everyone. Our group uh, started out by discussing um, how old ideas can be applied to new situations. And we narrowed in a little bit on thinking about um, the development or use of highly insulated buildings, um, which could include in some scenarios, you know, office spaces that um, maybe, you know, not going used or in other scenarios might include uh, pueblos of the type that indigenous communities have used for thousands of years to stay cool. Um, and so the question we were, we were thinking through was how could new resources or um, new um, programs be be brought to bear to, to support the use of those um, types of buildings uh, or support uh, people in accessing them. Um, so we identified as some essential partners um, that there are, for example, ha hazard mitigation funding that um, uh, doesn't typically go towards um, cooling or cool spaces, um, but getting the you know hazard mitigation world uh, to to support it might include uh, engaging FEMA or Red Cross among other sort of emergency management type of folks, um, and also uh, in order to make those uh, solutions as um, resilient uh, as possible uh, to ident by di identifying potentially multiple structures in a given area um, so that if something goes wrong with one of them, you know, you have that that uh, sort of redundance to, to support your resilience. Uh, then we talked about microgrids specifically and thinking about um, not just high tech microgrids uh, with you know, the latest solar panels and battery, but also um, geothermal and um, other and solutions that have, you know, been used uh, by Indigenous groups for, for many years. And um, we uh, recognized that power generation and um, uh, use is uh, often a very highly regulated environment. And so for microgrids as a solution, it is, um, can be very important to get engaged in um, advocacy and to engage local representatives uh, to push for the regulatory environment to become more amenable, um, which is already happening, but um, uh, could, could continue to, to um, sort of move forward on that path. Um, then our third solution we discussed was um, about regulatory frameworks, uh, really focusing more on, on housing and, um, for example, the concept of a maximum temperature threshold for housing, which has been uh, instituted in some places. Uh, and we discussed how um, not only is it important to, uh, you know, for the building code, you know, regulators to to be hearing from advocates on this, um, but to also be engaging civic associations and, um, as I think somebody else mentioned earlier, um, renters as um, a, a key stakeholder group um, and uh, thinking about renters associations or other sort of housing justice advocacy type associations as partners to engage. Um, and then we also focused on uh, solutions-based journalism. And um, when it comes to developing narratives for any of these solutions, um, you know, cr uh, creating a story based on people and sort of real experiences, uh, while also trying to highlight solutions and um, looking for those journalists that are really interested in in conveying uh, solutions and stories about things that are being done in new ways or um, succeeding in new ways. Uh, and and um, then we all, the last sort of category of things we talked about was. Um, uh, different methods for uh, empowering communities or uplifting, you know, existing community solutions and power. And um, in particular, uh, we discussed the train the trainer model. Um, so, you know, ways to really engage community members and leaders in um, uh, further 
uh, sharing, circulating, disseminating um, information and resources that can um, help amplify the number of people reached in a given campaign. I think that about summarizes it. Nambi, would you add anything from our group? Okay, that's it from group four. Thank you. Well, it is very surprising to find ourselves at the end of this two day workshop that we have spent the past few months planning. And I would just like to thank everyone very sincerely for your incredible participation, the creativity, the heart, and of course, the incredible intellect that all of you have dedicated in the past couple of days, also especially to our committee members the past few months and to the National Academy staff who are, have been our fearless leaders throughout. Thank you so, so very much for your leadership in this incredibly important day from this with all of the collective learnings. We hope you will continue to contribute to the Jamboard. Those contributions will be added to the proceedings report that will be developed subsequent to our meeting today. So please do continue to engage there um, if you haven't already or if you have already. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone.